So, Birdo, listeners were emailing in to me, frantically asking that the two of us watch Bad Vegan on Netflix and talk about it on the podcast. What do you say? Let's do it. Let's do it. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist, and I'm also a professor. My name is Umberto Castaneda, and I make erotic origami. Netflix document, document, documentary. Dacuma, dacuma. <laughs> Four episodes. Rotten Tomatoes Critics Score, Berto. What do you think? Ooh, interesting. Okay, I'm going to give it a 85. 100. No, really? 100. 100? And, okay. you know, so that people understand what that means, it's that 100% of the top critics, yeah. critics gave it a positive review. Okay. That means that all of them could have given it a 3 out of 5 or something. Right. But it's usually a... You know, it's an aggregate of the critics vibe of the movie yeah, or the document documentary. Document. <laughs> um, and so a hundred percent audience score. Ninety. I mean I was gonna go higher audience than critics, but no I... Audience twenty six. <laughs> what? You've never been more far I've off. I've never been more wrong. Twenty six? Why do you think the audience hated it but the critics oh loved it? Oh my god, I don't no. Is the topic not interesting to people? I don't get it. Well, let me read some of the negative. Some of the half. You can give a half star. Okay. On, oh on my God. One person said, a boring soap opera about beautiful rich people getting conned. <laughs> I, okay. I mean, I can kind of understand that. Sure. I, like if someone were watching this and it didn't grab them, I don't see anything like inherently our our artistic about this <laughs> creation you know it, absolutely it's, it's a it's a news story right put to fancy editing you know absolutely the reason i thought the critics were lower you know i have criticisms of it as a documentary like what but, uh you know i i thought the soundtrack was way over the top it was oh. like so dramatic every moment. Dun 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 yeah. dun 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 dun, and then she opened the letter. Dun 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 dun. I could see how someone would have technical problems with this. Maybe find parts of it boring. I also see the idea of like, oh, these people are so you know they're wealthy and they're complaining. Okay, I get it, but I still find it. Why was the other one we saw like the Tinder swindler? Why was that one? Well, I think that's another know? factor. Is the onslaught of these kinds yeah, of... Yeah, maybe people are getting tired of it. Yeah, because there was the Anna Delvey <laughs> yeah. recreation. Yeah. There's the new Elizabeth Holmes recreation. There's there's the... Uh, what was that? Dirty John recreation <laughs> right. that came out. So it it's getting... there's. I think we've reached saturation, maybe. I don't know. Peak elite con. <laughs> A peak con artist. Oh, because now there's the WeWork stuff, too. Right. And then there was the... And it's related to the like the Fire, Fire Festival. Fest and the, the Elizabeth Holmes and right. all that stuff. Another person said, I did not feel bad for Sarma. Her lack of answers to everything was just proof she was either a useful idiot or a willing accomplice. Okay, fine. But let, sure, we can debate that. But why does that reflect negatively on the document? Well, on I don't know. Do docu. I'm the document. I, I think, yeah, I don't know what it is about that word. I, I mean, documentary is a word that I was very familiar with, but yeah. then there were other iterations of that word, like documentarian. I oh, think sure. that kind of got into, that's a different accent, document. Daku, daku. Yeah. I think that, the which I kind of get, I like, well, how many Birdos out of 10 would you give it, Birdo? I was, I, 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 I was a seven for this one. Yeah, I think I gave it a seven as well. Yeah. I mean, it's perfectly you know, serviceable doc I, I found it perfectly fine. Like I said, my biggest, like, mechanical issue with it was actually the soundtrack. But um, I thought, I didn't find it overly long. At first I felt like some parts, but 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 the chapters actually made sense. You know, like, yeah. first chapter sets up her background, what's up, and then it introduces the conflict. The second one really goes into, like, the brewing of the conflict. The third one is, like, the the really downward spiral. And then the last one's like the resolution. I thought I found that fine. Um, so at the same time, uh, it wasn't as interesting as some of the other documentaries, but yeah, seven was, yeah, it's, it's good. The seven is good though. Yeah. I enjoyed it. I, yeah. I found it interesting. Yeah. And the fact that it's about beautiful, rich people, I don't know. I, I don't know why that doesn't bother me. Uh, of course, there's a, uh, blue-eyed blonde victim aspect to this similar to tinder swindler i mean 
people are being conned all the time all over the world, why is it that we as a society or filmmakers choose to focus on the blonde, blue-eyed victims as opposed yep. to the vast majority of other victims that aren't blonde and blue-eyed? You know what oh, I mean? And honestly, part of it is that uh, you can make stories about, you know, so you can imagine the documentary. It's like, so what, what happened? Well, yeah, like someone in my life, I'll just take it to me because uh, I was narcissistic and all the stories revolve around me and I go on long tangents about me. Uh, you know, many years ago, maybe 20 years ago, uh, a good friend of mine asked to borrow a $1,000. Hmm. And I did and, you know, it took a very, very long time to get it back. Would that have made for an interesting document? Ta-ta? <laughs> <laughs> like, so tell me what happened. Dun, 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 dun. I lent the $1,000. Well, I think it's possible that there are interesting stories of let's just say people other than blonde and blue eyed. Sure. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, Don't like, like Fire Festival is also about rich, yeah. white, privileged victims. Elizabeth Holmes, mm. blonde and blue eyed. Well, it's a little interesting. I wouldn't say Fire Fest that much, but yes, in general, at the same time, I've, I, you know, the, the thing is like, look, this was a prominent restaurant in New York that yeah. people that would have known. I didn't know about it, but people that yeah. would have known would have known. Yeah. As I'm watching it, I'm not thinking, how dare you focus? No. I think it's definitely worthy of a documentary. Yes, yeah. It's a big news story. Like yeah. if you had lived in New York and you had gone there, that would have probably been like me. I would have always been talking about it. Probably I've been like, yeah. Kirk, we got to go to Purple Onion or whatever it's called. Yeah. And it was a <laughs> famous story enough yeah. that people in the know heard just the tagline instead of the full story which exactly. is way more interesting which we'll get into so i, I want to start off by asking you some questions berto is sarma a victim or a criminal or something else she's definitely something else she's got she was definitely a victim and she also committed some crimes and and defrauded some people that didn't deserve to be defrauded did she knowingly commit crimes outside of being brainwashed and, and uh, abused uh yeah i think i think there were some cases where now I, I, of course the motivations were still because she was she was in a place that she was finding almost impossible to get out of but at the same time uh she did she knew what she was doing when she went in front of investors and lied to their faces about what the money was for and she knew what she was doing when she lied to her friend who had lent her all the two million bucks and said oh my associate michael such and such didn't make the flight like those are clear lies that she was telling someone closer now was she under pressure did she feel scared yes and so that plays into it she was definitely victimized and you know traumatized and all that at the same time i i feel she bears some responsibility and even in her answers in the documentary it's it's clear that it was clear to me at least that she hadn't fully come to terms with everything she had done. Mm -hmm. So that's my feeling. Yeah, I disagree slightly. We'll get into that later. Was Sarma gaslit? I I think to a certain extent, yes, because he took steps to uh, make up fake people, uh, use her emails and things to uh, invent stories to convince her of things that were flatly not real told her constantly told her deeper and deeper outlandish lies to try to convince her of an alternate reality made her question her own beliefs and what she thought was real and blah 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 constantly uh, yeah i think so yeah i agree uh but Berto, she lied to her friend the investor about who chris was just as one example just straight up to his face it is and she knew she was lying. She knew she knew that she was lying. Yeah. Is she responsible for lying and all the other things that she did? Yeah, it's one of those gray areas. But you know, if if I always look at extremes and then question whether what I would do. So imagine someone's been gaslit, they've been traumatized, they've been told that the world is upside down, and then they murder ten people as a result. Do they bear zero responsibility? Do they bear some responsibility? I think. In that case, you know, you'd probably say, like, oh, man, like, you shouldn't have been killing those people. Yeah, you are a victim, and it's tragic, but you were 20, you were 40 or something by the time you did this. So uh, this is not as extreme, but do I feel like she broke some laws? Yes. Do I feel like she should have known better in some of these instances? Yes. Yeah, we have some similar cases. The Manson family, for example, the three women, young women who were 
who committed heinous, heinous murders, yeah. multiple murders at the behest of Charlie Manson after being brainwashed into his cult for months, I believe, if not years. You also have the younger kid. Was it Malvo? What, what, what was that? The sniper in the car. Oh, right. The two guys. Right. Uh, well, it was the guy and then a, a much younger yeah. kid, like he was 16 yeah. or 17 or something like that. And he actually committed several of the murders himself, right. I believe. And it's this question. How responsible is someone after being abused and gaslit and brainwashed? Uh, you know, I, we'll get into that later. Uh, was she... Was she the actual con artist? Because the mm -hmm. documentary kind of asked this question because, you know, she's the real con artist because she married him for his money. Is she the real con artist here? There's some, there's some weird things about her. Uh, you know, I, I did some reading after the fact. Uh, she ended up having uh, an affair with her lawyer who was married. And, uh, you know, not moralizing. It's just very chaotic. Uh, there were a few other things that I was like, man, this is a chaotic person, actually. Um, so I think may maybe there is a possibility that it initially was in her head like, oh, this guy seems to have a lot of money. This could be helpful for the restaurant. And maybe, you know, maybe one quick way to do it. I mean, they even said it in the documentary. It's like, well, you know, if, if I marry him, I don't have to pay taxes. So do I feel like there was a little bit of a, I don't know if I'd call it a con, but certainly an opp opportunistic angle to her actions? Yes. Okay. Uh, do I think that she was lo running a long con on everyone and all the investors? No, no, I don't think that. No, I think that question was, one, ridiculous, particularly given what phase we were in the documentary that clearly laid out the yeah. years and years yeah. of abuse and gaslighting that she was going through. And two, just ridiculous on its face because in how did in the how in the world did she benefit from this whole situation yeah <laughs> she disbenefited the everything fell apart yep. she lost her restaurant she went in the debt two million dollars she went to prison she lost all her friends she yep. lost all of her family like everything It'd be impossible to make that as a like unless unless she was always planning to become destitute that was her big plan <laughs> yeah uh, um <laughs> Should Sarma have seen the signs? Should because that's I think that's another reason why a lot of people didn't like it on Rotten Tomatoes. It's just like, well, we're basically just watching an idiot that just should have known better. I mean, what's wrong with her? Okay, so first of all, I, I always this this is my pet peeve. I just watched The Graduate. I hate that movie. Why? Those people are just awful. Everyone's awful in the movie. He should have known better. She should like. Yeah, it's a good movie because it presents difficult situations and it shows us those people react. Like, just because you don't like the character's actions, why are you grading the movie? And I, I think the same pe same thing applies here. It's like saying that the documentary is bad because the people in the documentary are making stupid decisions. I don't get that at all. Yeah, I think it's a... <laughs> I, I know this is insulting, but I think it's a childish way of consuming art. That yes. You want to have a hero. You want someone you can identify sure. with because you haven't graduated to a point. I'm not saying that only immature people dislike this documentary, but that criticism I find to be, and we'll get into it when, when we eventually talk about turning red, which will be later next week. Uh, but I, I find that attitude to just be like, so unless you can identify with a hero like you know <laughs> captain america or something you you you, you can't like it was <laughs> was anthony the victimizer the abuser was he delusional about crossing over to the other side or was he lying the entire time or something in between um that's harder to tell i i we didn't get direct interviews with the guy uh, in some of those recordings that they played that were the, you know, the court had access to, it really painted this weird m in between picture where I, th I think like he kind of bought his own BS sometime and he was obviously also always lying, you know, yeah. and the fact that he invented a whole different person told her, oh yeah, yeah, this is my security guy had full ongoing conversations with her. 
like unless he's constantly dissociating like no yeah the guy is a psychopath you know he's right I, I don't think he was delusional at all i think there were times when the role play he was particularly into the role play if you will like how emotional he would get to her but but he yeah. was completely you know because people who are delusional will exhibit a whole suite of behaviors confusion and uh because the way that it seems and they, i don't think they really painted this picture well enough for us and it took a while for it to because for the first i don't know two and a half hours of the documentary he keeps asking for money and we don't really have any idea what he's doing he claims he's in africa killing rebels or That's something right. And yeah. By the way, I really liked how they did the thing with the with his handler. Yeah, because I'm like, well, wait. So maybe this is true. right. I totally fell for it. I right, and admit, I think that I totally that was, fell for it. I liked that be, that uh, if you didn't, you know, in the documentary, they have a character who they act like as a real person they're interviewing, but in reality, it's just a fiction of of Anthony's imagination. And then they reveal that later on, like this person we've been interviewing the whole time isn't a real person. And I thought I liked that because it makes us as viewers also having been ga gaslit a little bit mm -hmm. or, or brainwashed. Anyway, the it wasn't until later that you discover, oh, I need to rewrite this whole history. He's not in Africa killing rebels. He's not right. going all over the planet doing black ops. He's sitting in front of three slot machines slowly <laughs> losing all of his money like some pathetic gambler you know what i mean so you're you're very likely totally right about him never being delusional the, the, there were only a couple of things that made me question it one was like i said the recordings i was like ah oh, that's weird but you're right he could have just been a really good actor in that sense and two that friend of his the russian guy yeah who said yeah i kind of think he believed his own bs but again he could have just been fooling him too I think he could have been really into his BS. Yeah. Like there could have been some element, uh, some truthfulness about it, like some new age belief system. That's not uncommon, right? Like, right. That's totally common. Well, that leads me to my next question. Is Anthony's religion any different than, say, Christianity? Right. What do you think? Um, well, <laughs> there are a couple of differences in that, for better or for worse, um, when someone says, hey, I'm a Christian, here's what I believe, they're not the only one, right? There, there's some social, societal validation that at least other people believe the same thing. And I'm not saying that that makes what they believe real. But what it, what it is, it's not coming out of left field. So when I show up at your house and I say, hey, Kirk, uh, just so you know, I am from Jupiter. And uh, we're invading next week. But if you give me all your money, we'll, we won't invade, right? I can't point to the Church of Jupiterians that's been around for a thousand years and that you've heard about, right? Like, I'm just saying this. I could be saying anything. So, you know, th there is that. There is that difference. Um, but other than, you know, make, inventing a, a, a set of beliefs and some things like that, like, it's kind of hard to tell them apart. You know, if, if you are into those kinds of beliefs also, yeah, someone in the documentary threw all us vegans under the bus when he's like, well, you know vegans, they're into all this new age bullshit. <laughs> they like believe all sorts of weird stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, was their sentence too much, too little, or just right? So just to catch you up, she got four months in prison. He got zero in prison, but he already had spent a, a year in prison before the trial because he couldn't make bail. Uh, was it too much, too little, or just right? So he's a dangerous individual. It, it, I don't know what is right, the right amount to keep him away from society, but he's a dangerous individual. <laughs> There's no way one year time served makes sense because he wasn't even evaluated for or tried for what really was going on, which was his ongoing years-long abuse and defraud of this person and her family. He was only evaluated for the, the investors that lost money, and it, it just doesn't make sense. Now, as far as her, uh, I, don't, I don't know. I, I don't know what the laws say about how much you should serve based on defrauding investors and stuff like that. So, Yeah, I mean, I don't think anyone believes that Sarma is going to not have learned her lesson one way or the other, you know? So I think that if we're talking about recidivism and fairness, I think four months makes sense to me. But yeah, for him, it's this weird question because of course, 
emotionally, I wouldn't mind if this guy was locked up for the rest of his life. He's a menace to society. And he probably offers nothing to nothing good to society. <laughs> you know, he's not like a, a fireman who like saves people from burning houses or he doesn't create art like he's 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 a menace and he's a compulsive he, gambler who keeps he, taking money from very vulnerable people right and he's not going to stop you know there, this yeah. is a, there's a chance maybe but given how psychopathic he is it's i wouldn't have a problem with him being in prison for 10 15 years it would seem commensurate with the abuse that he uh, committed but on the other hand you look at the law and you're thinking well he you know didn't really break severe laws and he just asked his wife for money hey yeah. i need money for this religion thing and he pressured and made promises but we do we really want the government to be involved in those kind of conversations you know say like i ask you for money berto and i say i have this you know wonderful uh, opportunity where you're going to go to heaven and I'm going to, I'm going to spend $10,000 on a shrine to you and it'll give you af something in the afterlife and you give me that money and, and I choose to gamble it away. Do we want the government to somehow get involved in those kinds of discussions between people, uh, particularly in a marriage? And I, you know, I don't know the answer to that question. I, I think that these, you know, when we see Tinder swindler, who goes to prison for what one or two years and is right back at it yeah. as soon as he's I just feel like there has to you know it's I said this during Tinder Swindler episode that we did it's similar to racketeering you look at uh, Al Capone and other mobsters and you look at their actual behavior they're not personally doing any crimes they are just a leader of a uh, uh, an informal organization that anyone at any time could leave if they wanted to. People are making personal choices and he's giving directives and you could say with intimidation, but it's, it, he didn't actually pull the trigger. Someone else pulled the trigger. He didn't actually steal the thing out of the truck. Someone else did, did that. So, and, and, and they kicked money up to him because they out of respect to him or something. So how is that illegal? But then, we created laws that said racketeering and organized, or, you know, organized crime that obviously the organization is set up to commit horrible crimes. And the person at the top under any evaluation is absolutely responsible for that, even though they didn't pull the trigger or commit the crimes themselves. And I think that when it comes to these kinds of crimes, similar to stalking, actually, right? Because, do we really want you know what people will say it's in the the liberal point of view not liberal in terms of liberal or conservative but liberal in terms of the way it used to mean which was anti-governmental power right what that you don't want to say to people you can't text someone you know you can't there, there are no contact orders this kind of thing but you can't demand that someone not go to the store it's a public place can they yeah. not go to the store and just kind of be you know nearby um they can't send someone a letter like what's wrong with that and but again the the i don't i the the victimization of stalking the victimization of gaslighting and abuse i find it just be so obvious that it should be criminal. I don't mind that being a part or a conversation for lawmakers. Uh, so a friend of mine just uh, three months ago was arrested and spent four days in jail. Why, you ask? What criminals do I associate with? Well, at one point, his license plate had been stolen and he had reported it as stolen and he had told the city and gotten a new license plate that whoever stole the license plate had gotten parking tickets and had, or speeding, I don't know, parking and or speeding tickets, whatever, that gotten tickets and had not paid them. And then he had notified the city and he got a summons to show up and he said, okay, showing up. And when he showed up at the court, they arrested him. <laughs> uh, he, of course, eventually argued with his lawyer in front of the judge after, after spending the four days in jail and stuff. And after presenting all the data, the judge just said, okay, you're free to go. 
So I feel like our legal system is a little silly when it comes to some of the edge cases. And I think that this is an example where these people harm whole families and they're free to go and harm whole families again. And all we can do is, well, I don't know. I mean, he just may definitely needs to be, in my opinion, some new laws passed regarding protections for individuals and when it comes to, you know, being defrauded like this. Um, it is hard. Well, not just defrauded. That, that's part of it for sure. Well, and raped, actually. <laughs> she, yeah, sexually she raped. assaulted. But also <laughs> the intimidation, fear, and control. Totally. Like the breaking down yeah. of someone's power yeah. and personality to the point where they're in a hotel, uh, you know, uh, wasting away because they can't get any vegan food in Tennessee or wherever town they were in in Tennessee. You know, I, I find that the the results are obvious. A crime is being committed. Yep. So, you know, I still think, I don't understand the laws about it and things like that. Do I think he served his time? No, absolutely not. Do I think she did? Uh, that I have less of an opinion on. Well, let's take a let's take a break. We get back. Let's diagnose the effort. What do you say? Let's do it. Hey, deserving listeners. As you all know, I am constantly recommending that people go to therapy. We all need therapy from time to time. Well, one of the options available that is definitely worth checking out is BetterHelp. If you're looking for a therapist, I would give it a try by going to BetterHelp.com slash Kirk. Make sure you use the promo code Kirk because you get 10% off your first month and it really helps us out. As you watch these videos, I know many of you have been motivated to find your own therapist, which is great because you deserve it. And I know also that it can be hard to find a good fit, find the right one for you. Well, one of the options available in terms of your shopping is to go to betterhelp.com slash Kirk. I've been told you can start communicating with your therapist in under 24 hours. You can message your counselor at any time. Plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions. I've also been told that it's often less expensive than in-person therapy, and you should know that this service is available to clients worldwide. So go to betterhelp.com slash Kirk to get 10% off your first month today. All right, we're back from the break. Before getting into the rest of this episode, I have an announcement to make, Bruno. So a little bit ago, so dear listeners out there, I want you to really listen to this because I'm angry at you. (gasps) <gasps> oh, <laughs> I'm joking. But <laughs> what happened was I, long story short, became alerted to the fact that I had messed up in my editing of the episodes such that I left in a minute of silence. And actually, I'm angry at you too, you too, Berto. There was a minute of silence, just okay. just dead space in six episodes over the past six weeks. What? Yeah. Like, wait, wait, in the middle or at the end? In the middle. In the middle, yeah. Around the time the break would happen. There'd be this minute of silence. What? I'm guessing people don't care about this sort of thing, but I am a perfectionist when it comes to this podcast, and I always have been. Having even just a few seconds of silence will keep me up at night. Having a full effing minute over six weeks. So for a month and a half, I have been publishing episodes on accident with a minute of silence in the middle of the episode. So that's mortifying to me. No one told you? That's what I'm angry about, Birdo. What? Did you not listen to your own episodes? Well, first of all, is the the ad on YouTube? The minute of silence was in YouTube. Maybe I haven't heard the whole episode then. (laughs) It's in Rebecca episodes. It's in your episodes. It's in Bob episodes. So I'm like, is no one, one, (laughs) my co, uh, like my co-host. So I definitely don't listen to most of the episodes we record. Okay. Well, yeah. If you don't, then you don't. And obviously I didn't. Yeah. So what are you going to do? I mean, I listen before I edit it, but anyway, but that the fact that no listener, because the thing is, is. I've been doing this podcast for 14 years. And yeah. In the beginning, when I would make a mistake, someone would pretty quickly email me. Yeah. They would say, "Hey, just to let you know, da da da." What? That's so bizarre because people comment about all sorts of small stuff. They'll they'll complain about anything. anything. The a minute of silence, no one said anything. One time, I would be surprised. Six weeks in a row. Six weeks That's in a crazy. row. Uh, one episode per week had a had a minute of silence. The only thing I can think of as to why this would happen is that the listeners think we are so big now 
that if something goes wrong with the podcast, someone else would have... Someone else is responsible. Yeah. This is bystander syndrome. So, which... Do you know which episode of ours that I was in it was? Cosby. Okay, that's weird because I actually listened to... I thought I listened to the whole thing on that, but maybe I didn't. No one... And that's the one I was reading the comments in because now I'm not reading comments. Right. But that one... No, no, no. I read Stacey, all the comments. Stacy and I look at the comments on YouTube as we no do... No one on, And that. on Patreon yeah. and on Discord and, you know, and on Facebook and no one told me anything. I am mortified. Oh, geez. That is, that is I, Stacey has hasn't seen me flip out to this level in a long time yeah i mean i was i was going what i mean i I, because i discovered it in one episode and it was Mm -hmm. random and then i was like well wait and i started listening to other episodes that what that episode has a minute of and then i started going and i i thought i thought it went back years but it went back (laughs) six weeks you know anyway people out there please let me know (laughs) if something goes wrong with the podcast go to the website and actually email us. Don't comment below because there's a chance it'll get buried in the comments or something, you know. And and if you actually are a mod on Discord or Facebook fan page, you have my direct email. So you could really do your part and eliminate my mortification. Okay. Yeah. Let's do an OPP, Berto. OPP. So these people became patrons all the way back in February of 2020. Back in the naive Whoa, month wow. of February of February 2020. 2020. And became and have stayed patrons ever since, Brittle. That's the key. It's Last one thing to become a to patron. Disney. You know, it, it the key is you gotta stay a patron. Right. That's that's where the real, you know, support kicks in. That's right. Aziz from Australia, Autumn from Glendale, California, Mito from God knows where, Mies from Raleigh, North Carolina, lovely town. And C. Aaron from Ohio, oh. Phoebe Mover, and Hannah from God Knows Where. Hannah's an annual patron. Uh, another Hannah. Wait, two Hannahs, right? Two Hannahs. So a Hannah signed up, and then another Hannah signed up okay. right after. That's bizarre. She's from New York, New York. Uh, Simulation confirmed. Julia <laughs> from God Knows Where. Susie from Grand Rapids, California. Grand Rapids, California. Huh. That I've never heard of. Gregory from Houston, and K from God Knows Where. Thank you all for becoming a patron and staying a patron all this time. All right, so let's get into gaslighting. Berto, what is your, what What do you think the definition of gaslighting is? We've been over this right many times before. I know it comes from a movie that I don't think I ever saw, but in general, I think it's when someone uh, aware, being aware of what they're doing and consciously uh, deceives someone else to make them believe that what they think is real is not real, and they, they want them to believe uh, an alternate reality, uh, probably for malicious purposes. They're trying to, you know, abuse them or take advantage of them in some way. And so they, they just, you know, they lie. They set up situations to make them think something happened when it didn't. They just flat out tell them that something happened when it didn't. And ultimately, the other person just starts questioning what is real and starts only trusting in that person. Yeah, it's mostly right. The one detail I would add is that it's not trying to convince the victim of a reality. It's trying to convince the victim they don't know reality. Mm. You're trying to convince the victim that they can't judge reality, and thus you as the victimizer can insert whatever you want. And it could change from day to day. So, and the other part that I would say is the other detail that I would add to is you, you said purposeful. That is a form of a type of gaslighting that I've determined uh, and but doesn't usually get discussed in the literature is the non-purposeful type, oh. which is the majority of gaslighters. What, what is, I don't get that. So like, most people who are gaslighting, I'm guessing, it's hard to know. There's, I don't think, any research on this, but I think it stands to reason, is at least mostly, mostly non-purposeful in that you have people who are uh, very attachment insecure and desperate for closeness and learned from modeling that they're uh, that it's okay to abuse people in various different ways and they learn over time that in order to retain closeness with someone they have to well how do i explain this 
and listen to all of our other deep dives on gaslighting for more information on this. But essentially what happens is, well, let, let me just try to play it out between you and me, Berta. Let's say okay. I'm the victimizer, you're the victim. And I sense that you're moving away from me. You're not as interested in me. You're spending time with other friends or you're oh, doing other- Oh, I see and, what you're and, getting and, at. And I'm hurt. And mm-hmm. so I, I start going, okay. you know those other friends I see. don't really like you. I get it. And you're like, you're like, oh. So less the movie villain kind of gaslighting and more of just like these these ways to try to keep the person with you. Right. And you don't you don't necessarily realize that what you're doing is gaslighting. Them. Right. <laughs> I see. But the but the effect is very gaslighting. Wait, are you gaslighting me right now about the definition of gaslighting? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and most abuse in my experience is non purposeful abuse. In this situation with uh, Anthony, it was in my estimation, the purposeful psychopathic kind, which is actually mm. rare, uh, yeah. but uh, very obvious when you see it. The other type that we've I've developed over time in conversations with the listeners and others is what I'm calling systemic gaslighting, which is like organizational system gaslighting. Like when you're a black person in Jim Crow South and you feel powerless and you're trying to ask for voting rights or or respect mm. or equality and the system is saying but you are equal there's yeah. nothing the, right. there's no law that says black people are lesser you have all the same opportunities as everyone else yep, yep. there must be something about you you must be yeah you know, and the perpetrators of the systemic gaslighting uh probably in the majority of them and in their minds don't really understand that they're gaslighting. You know, yeah. it's just it's it's motivated reasoning on their part because it, priv- it it supports their idea that they're special or yeah. deserving or something, and so the system can gaslight people. It's not the traditional usage, but I I find that um, I've expanded at least my definition to include that because I think it it deserves that kind of strong label of gaslighting. Mm-hmm. Of course, the internet uses gaslighting. Do you know how the internet and, and the general public uses gaslighting today? No, I mean, you've, you've talked a bit, is, is it just like basically saying something that's not real or? Yeah, so, and, but it's almost universal. So mm-hmm. say you and I are in an argument or something yeah. and I'm like, I'm like, um, wow, I mean, you're coming on a little strong right now. Mm-hmm. And you're like, no, I'm not, I'm just telling you how I feel. And I'm like, whoa, Berto, like, calm down like you're a little intense and you're like what stop are you talk- gaslighting me bro. right but then i would say you're gaslighting me oh, so really? that's what you'll see is like because according to the internet definition i'm gaslighting you by inserting thoughts into your head i see and you're gaslighting me by denying what you're actually doing <laughs> I see, I see, I see. but that's not gaslighting people that's just lying or being in denial but anyway so if you want to see one example of actual gaslighting this documentary is, oh, absolutely! Yeah. Is it? Yeah. It is, uh, and they and they beautifully, uh, you know, in a dark way, just you know, depict it yes. in that you can, and that's why the documentary had to be slower. It had to, yeah. and that's why they had that actor who, guy, yeah. who plays a fictitious. They cast him just right too, because I'm like, oh, I believe this, <laughs> right? And so. <laughs> They, it, I, although I did find it weird where he was sitting, I'm like, where is that exactly? Well, okay, so this is a very interesting thing. They, he comes on the scene, you know, he comes from like the back and he goes and yeah. sits down on the chair. And I'm like, okay, okay, who's this? And then he says, I was uh, Anthony's handler or whatever the name at the time. I was his handler. And I'm like, oh, okay, so he was. And then I'm thinking, wait, why is he allowed to talk about this? Right. It totally was working on me. Yeah, it totally was. Now, I mean, granted, I started, I started thinking, wait, what, what I actually started thinking is this guy must have been in on it, and now he's kind of coming forward. Right. That's what I started thinking. Yeah, that was the only way to make it make sense. Yeah. Because like, certainly after a little bit, I was like, okay, no, he's not really doing all this BS. Yeah. <laughs> but I didn't think that it was him just lo- pretending to be someone else. No. That was a good get. Yeah. <laughs> um. So. The way that gaslighting actually works is depicted very well in this documentary. It's not the only presentation, but it is a it's a strong one in that it's very slow because 
they lay it out in the documentary very kind of slowly, but know that this took place over the span of five years or something. Right. And his tactics were just classic. You start with love bombing, which is another bastardized term on the internet. So this is a real example of love bombing. Yeah. And in my investigation of the the term, I've come up with two different types. There's the psychopath, similar to gaslighting, there's a psychopathic possible sadistic type. And then there's the attachment desperation type, which is love bombing on accident. And most love bombing is probably on accident due to attachment desperation. But anyway, his type was psychopathic in that he knew what he was doing uh, in all likelihood, but it could have also had some attachment desperation in there as well, which I, I want to uh, point out that psychopaths are not from another planet. They, they're not a different species. They have, you know, they go to the bathroom and they like to watch Netflix documentaries and they like to have attachment security. Mm. Uh, just because you're, you know, the way that psychopaths are depicted, it's that they don't, they, they I think people uh, equate empathy, the capacity for empathy with wanting relationships. Mm. And they say, well, they're, if they don't have empathy, then they don't want relationships. Right. You can actually lack empathy, but still want attachment security. Well, as you know, as we've covered in the past, uh, Ted Bundy right. had relationships and wanted those relationships. Yeah, yeah. and his uh, desperation and rejection around attachment and security, particularly with one woman when he was in his early 20s, she broke up with him, yeah. that threw him into such a state, and then he started killing. Right, right. Uh, not, not that it's her fault by any means, but not, yeah. it does help explain and help us maybe to prevent these kinds of things from happening in the future. But anyway, so I, in my deep dive on love bombing, I came up with the following signs or ways in which love bombing happens. And the definition of love bombing that I developed was something along the lines of showering someone with affection very quickly and then at some point pulling back if it's psychopathic, it's a showering of affection to suck them in. If it's attachment desperation, it's actually felt. You actually feel all that love, but then you get triggered and you pull. Anyway, but the signs are choosing a vulnerable target, which I think she was, which we'll get into later. Frequent compliments, which we saw. Communicate often, which we saw. Move quickly in the relationship. And this is interesting because I developed this before I watched this documentary. Okay. What is, oh, you developed the steps to love bombing? Yeah, I've developed yeah. these signs okay. of love bombing prior to the documentary. And the one that really stuck out to me when I was reviewing my list was might offer to save you. Okay. Which was Interesting. a main part of, totally. of his love bombing. He's like, oh, your money? Like, that's nothing. I, I'm going to give you 10, 10 times as much. Everyone is going to be paid right. up. She was concerned with three things. Yeah. Her dog. Yeah. Her debt. Oh yeah, and her dog will live forever. Yeah. I forgot about that, yeah. Her debt and her restaurant. Yeah. He was gonna save all three. Right. And, re you know, repeatedly, you know, that was his whole yeah. thing. Um, and arguably, they got married because she's like, this is my path to all three of those things happening, you know, particularly yeah. the restaurant and the debt going away. Push for a commitment very quickly. You might find yourself agreeing to things you wouldn't normally do. I think we saw that for her. They don't react well when you try to slow down. That's the key to, to love bombing. That's that. That's what I said about how you can, because when you describe love bombing, you're like, well, how does this differ from just falling in love? Right. You're, you're in love with someone. You want to be with them. You want to talk to you, you. You can't stop looking at them. You think they're the best. That We evolved to couple. That's our totally. thing. But how can you differentiate between love bombing and just falling in love? And the, the difference is when you try to slow down a little bit and say like, hey, I, I, I'm not ready to get married or something, mm. they don't react well. Mm. People that aren't love bombing are, they'll be like, oh, okay, yeah, whatever you wanna do. Um, so, uh, they might give many gifts. You might feel an unnamed fear of displeasing them. Your friends say you've changed in a bad way. We saw that in the documentary. They might talk crap about your exes or other people in your life. There might be a big age difference. There wasn't I don't, at all. 
and the love bomber might get hurt easily. Anyway, so um, that so he love bombs in the beginning for the gaslighting because you gotta in order to psychopathically gaslight someone. You, you have, have to, to first establish yourself as like super important to them and you're going to be their savior. And yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. You have to, it's the dentist yeah. system on it. So yeah. you got, you got to establish your worth. They have the to beginning. depend on. Yeah. yeah. Um, then you escalate your gaslighting. So with Anthony, it's in the beginning. And she even talked about it. So he's like, she's like, yeah, he would introduce one weird thing, which seemed weird, but not really weird. And then the next weirder thing, and then you'd get used to that, and the next weirder thing would be even more weird, but you're kind of already right. used to the weird. Yeah, he certainly didn't start with, listen, uh, by the way, nice to meet you. Uh, so you're going to be the queen of this weird house in L.A. that I'm a part of because I'm a super alien kind of thing. Like, no, right. that was not it. It was just like, yeah, no, I just I travel a lot. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. And then it's, I'm in the, I'm, I used to be military. Yeah. Just, oh, okay. I can't talk about it too much. Yeah, I can't really talk about it. Oh, okay. Oh, don't look at my laptop because it says CIA on it. Oh, I got to leave town for a while because I got a thing to do. No biggie. Huh, and where? then it's probably, he probably was using it like, okay, you know what? You, I, I can tell that I can trust you. So I'll, right. I'll let you know that blah. <laughs> right. So just think about yeah. it, it, especially when you're in a romantic relationship, you're talking every day, all day. Yeah. So just think about every little iteration as, little as you start. Brick, to, brick, yeah. Brick. And this shows to me that he knew what he was doing. Yeah, that he had already conned or had tried to con and learn from his mistakes from the past. Well, we heard from his um, first ex, wife, that, but I'm yeah. guessing there were other relationships in between there right. that he made that he screwed up, that he right. failed with. Because when he came in with Sarma, he had it down. Yeah. He had a slick story <laughs> that was impervious to investigation. Because if you're black ops, there's no record of that, right? Yeah. And if you're traveling, it's like, well, how would you know? So he, he just slowly, you know, but then, then eventually it's the demons are after us. The family is testing you. You need to wire me $100,000 or else uh, Leon yeah. won't live forever, you know, and also slowly starts to take over every aspect of her life. Eventually, he has control of all her accounts, her emails, money. Her bank accounts, everything. Yeah. Over, like, her, <laughs> over her body, even. Yeah. You know, which was really disturbing to that hear. That was really disturbing. Um, and then years later, you're in a hotel in Tennessee with no money, completely cut off from your family and friends, depressed, confused, powerless. Your life is completely falling apart. You're running from the law. And this is very similar to other kind of cults. You know, this guy was a one-man gaslighting, love-bombing cult. <laughs> yeah. And so if you want to learn about cults and initiation and coercive control, this is also a good documentary because it really lays out how this could happen. You know, you can imagine that, let's say he wasn't romantically involved with her, but was a religious leader of some kind. And she yeah. was she was desperate for some spiritual you know, leadership or something, or maybe Leon, her dog, was sick and she goes to vets and they can't help and then she finds this thing online that's you know come to me i'll solve all your problems and then there's you know 50 people following him like it's just a a very textbook example of how you suck someone in totally. and slowly every day break them down mentally break them down you don't know what you're talking about you know and the recorded conversations i think are the are the best way of depicting it because you could really see the kind of rapid fire that he would exhibit you know he would go from warmth i love you I, I love you you know you know that i do and then he'd just be like you know you're totally killing me right now you like the demons are gonna get me because like, i'm you. literally I, i'm the one they're gonna tear apart yeah i'm the one that's gonna go down you realize that he, if you don't if you don't worry wire me this money you're literally putting me in six feet under the ground, you know? He used this combination of, okay, first of all, I'm in mortal, literally mortal, actually more than mortal. It's very similar demons. to Tinder Swindler. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But but actually, the Tinder Swindler was still grounded in, like, you know, uh, human problems. This guy's like, no, no, no. I mean, it's demons that are after me, right? But then he would couple that with, and by the way, you're being tested. And so, of course, it's hard. It's do you think it's not going to be hard? What you're going to be rewarded with is 
unbelievable. So, which is also the same as Tinder Swindler, at least yeah. that second part yeah. you said. You give me this fifty grand, and I will give you millions. Oh, like you don't even understand. Like in fact, in the recording, at one point he laughs. Like oh, you think you're stupid, two million dollars, right. whatever. Which is another gaslighting aspect. Yeah. Of you're worried about two million dollars. You're ridiculous. Yeah. You're stupid. Which is another part of gaslighting is the putting down, the, <laughs> the smarmy, um, you know, way of uh, just breaking. So you're just this attitude of like you're just an idiot. I love too when it's you know there's all these moments where he says, I you know like you send me the money is like well but I haven't seen the money. It's like well the money hasn't been touched. It's on a shelf. Okay, well where's the shelf? Yeah. It's like that's not the point. <laughs> no, no, no. But 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 if you watch that and, and you describe that well, then he's like, "Why are you bringing this up? We've already talked about yeah, this." Yeah, yeah. So he he has a he's like a politician. He has yeah. an answer for everything yeah. because his his shtick is down. And and if you have never experienced this before, and it's why would you? If you've never been educated on it, why would you? And your uh, sarma, you're just like. What is happening right now? You know, the the, the thing that I, I think people need to understand about human manip manipulation is that if you have two people in a room or on a conversation on a phone call or something, and one person appears to be 100% convinced and the other person feels like they're 75% like convinced of themselves, confident in what they're... Right. It's very... Uh, tempting if you're the 75 percent to go well they seem more sure yeah I, i'm mostly sure that this guy's crazy i'm mostly sure that he's conning me but he's a hundred percent sure that he's not so i must be wrong you know we have this right. it's a human bias that i'm sure works well for us most of the time you know it's like i'm 75 percent sure that jumping off this cliff is not going to kill me, but this person is 100% sure that it's going to kill us. So therefore, maybe I should go with them. I think that's the bias that helps us that can be utilized by psychopaths. Well, and, and you know, there was some advantage, I'm sure, over time as, as humans to sit there and wait it out. You know, if you think about it, things didn't happen quickly back in the old days. You know, um, food doesn't materialize out of thin air. Uh, the animals don't come by at the convenient times. The crops take a while to grow, right? So we kind of developed this need for patience and hope. Like, let's just hope the river comes by this time and the water comes and the plants grow because yeah. we got to just wait it out. Okay. And Especially so, if someone seems so convinced it's going to happen. Yeah, and so she's looking at it like, well, there were these signs early on that he was doing some things that I can't quite explain. He knew this. He knew I was in California. How did he know that? Yeah. But at the same time, I don't know. But then she's like gambler's dilemma in it. Like, but I can't give up now. What if he's right? right? I mean, if he's right. Right. That was another huge bias at play, seemingly, which was at the, in the beginning, you could see how, well, we're engaged or we're married. I'll give him 10 grand. I'll give yeah. him 15 grand. Um, I have money coming in. It's okay. Things things are on the up. Things are going well, and he seems to have money. He did show up with those diamonds that one time. Yeah. So and his dad keeps vouching for him, and there's this other guy that I keep communicating with. Da da da. So you know maybe it'll work. Um, and if I turn it down, you know if I start letting questions into my head, that will probably cause me to pull away from him. I and. And this is, so let me go into denial. <laughs> we are masters as humans of denial. No, maybe, I don't think so. Maybe a lot of animals <laughs> are. You and I right now have to be in denial, which it's a functional thing, denial. Yeah. It's not, it's not, you and I, in order to function in this conversation, have to be in denial of poverty and famine that's going on right now. There right. are thousands of people. And war. <laughs> at this very second, and, and war, yeah. at this second, who are dying of famine and poverty and atrocities right now, Berto. Yeah. Human beings, just as worthy of compassion and rights as you and I are, that are currently dying even in our own country. If we focus on that, we wouldn't be able to get anything done. Right. Right now, not that we don't ever, not that we're always in denial of that, yeah. but we have to be able to compartmentalize to function. Right now, we, you and I, in order to function in this conversation, we have to understand that you and I 
even by just making this podcast and moving electrons around, it's actually not technically moving electrons, but <laughs> you know what I mean, that uh, using electricity, we are actually contributing to the destruction of our planet. Right. Uh, you drove over here in your car. It's a hybrid. <laughs> and you, you, all the things that we're doing, you know, yeah. the clothes on our back have petroleum all yeah, over yeah. it. And I, t I take showers with petroleum. We that have helps. to be in denial of that in order, in order to function. Yeah. Um, and you could say our denial of it is our downfall in, in that in that. Uh, arena. So, or, there another, are, or maybe, maybe another are, one is we have to be in denial of the fact that we're going to be dead one day and none of this will matter. Absolutely. But there are certainly more pragmatic, practical daily matters that get attended to because of that denial. Uh, you're obviously leading to the fact that there's these chronic, like high levels of denial at play yeah. in these situations. Right. <laughs> and so for Sarma, and I think this is the piece that I. If you didn't understand watching it, and I'm guessing many of you did out there in podcast land, but if you didn't, it's you're looking at Sarma and you're just like, what is wrong? Like, especially as the threshold started to be crossed, twenty thousand dollars, a hundred thousand dollars, five hundred thousand. At what point do you say, wait, no, 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 this is too much? Denial is a very useful mechanism for us that can be utilized or engaged when it causes destruction for us. Like when you're in a relationship with someone who's abusive, when you're in a relationship with someone who has alcoholism or something, because the way that our brains work is we take the path of least resistance. Yeah. So if we run into a problem, Sarma runs into a problem, she wakes up in the, and you could tell even in her conversations that she recorded with him, that she had some skepticism. Totally. Okay, where's the shelf? She's yeah. like, the money's on a shelf. Where's the shelf? Okay, yeah. she wouldn't ask that question if she didn't have it's some. Like, I could pay that loan. It's like, well, do it. Do it. Uh, but, and so she gets off the phone and she runs into a problem in her mind where if she goes down the road of questioning, that leads, she immediately recognizes, I'm going to have to break up with him because I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to realize. Divorce. Yeah. Divorce. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to divorce him. Yeah. I'm going to have to give up on the dream of Leon living forever and him paying off the debt. And now all these debts are real and there's no mystery savior coming to. Right. I, I'm worse off yeah. than before I met him. I, I'm going to have to date again, and um, I actually like him. We actually do have an emotional connection that I don't think they really depicted well enough because I think that they did to some extent, uh, at least at times. Yeah. Um, I'm going to have to be humiliated in front of all my friends and family. I'm going to have to maybe deal with him. God knows if he is in the military and he does kill me in my yeah. friends or Leon. Well, she she was clearly afraid for physical reasons because she would ask him what what because he would be like, well, you're so tough because I'm not there in person. And she would ask him, well, what are you going to do to me if you if you were right. here? Well, I think she was baiting him at that point. To Certainly because they were recording it, but <laughs> yeah. still, like it's yeah. you know. But yeah, so or so you can face all that just. Horrible, horrible, horrible uh, consequences in a whole, ver including death, or you go into denial and you just say yeah. to yourself, it's not true. None of that is true. And I'm just going to go through my day. And there are different levels of denial. There's a level of denial that's deep where it's almost like delusional and you're fully brainwashed. There's also levels of denial where you're just like, well, I just don't want to deal with it today. I just have to get through one more day and you're just in survival mode. And that's at least by the time the recorded conversations happen, it kind of seemed like she was in that space where there was a big part of her that knew something was very wrong, but there was another part of her that probably woke up in the morning. And was just like, I just maybe, but maybe it'll work out, you yeah. know? And I just have to hope that it works and I just have to get through today. And everyone is capable of that victimization and that gaslighting and that denial. And until you realize yeah. that out there, you are vulnerable to victimization. You have to know, I could be a victim of that. Because when you recognize that, you can protect yourself from the early signs. So a couple of things. One, uh, she not only was, you know, like you're saying, uh, starting to question, but 
her friends around her were trying to, you know, kind of help her, give her hints in that sense. Uh, at the same time... But not strong enough because she didn't, you know, she didn't have close right, enough right, friends because she was true. a loner. But she, right, yes. Which is another that, vulnerability. That it's another but, little But things like her dad and her sister. But you're right. It wasn't, they weren't close enough at that point. Yeah. Um, so she didn't have maybe that support structure to... Uh, uh, but at the same time, the other thing that wasn't helping her is she was able to keep getting money from investors. Now, of course, normally that would be a good thing. Like, you know, you're a good business person, you can go sell your idea and get money. It's just that in this case, it was working against her, sadly, because he'd be like, you need to get another hundred. She's like, I don't have it, but you can. You can. And it's like, okay, and then she would get it. Yeah. And that, that was not only enabling him, but it was enabling her to kind of keep going in the train. Yeah. So I, I can relate so much to the whole uh, actually the gaslighting aspect because of my dad you know he he was um, a child psychiatrist made good money in New York and then moved to Columbia and he started having issues and whatnot but the the thing that started happening is he would start asking people to borrow money and because he was the big hot shot you know had made it out of the country gotten his big degree he was the big doctor right he was doctor castaneda right like everyone looked up to him and he came with money so at first when he would ask for money it was like this very entitled request i would hear and watch him and so someone would be over and and he'd say uh dame ahí, which is like give me here like so it'd be some like oh i need to go to the store to buy some coke not cocaine like <laughs> drinking coke but really he was going to go buy cigarettes and probably pot or who knows maybe bet on some some uh gambling thing either way he'd say like oh give me here and at first people would because why wouldn't you like he's got so much money he's always paying for things yeah of course here oh, i didn't know that this is a interesting detail yeah, yeah. of your childhood this is how it started he would say oh just give me here and then that graduated to, and at first I didn't see this because he wouldn't do it around me, but, but then I started noticing. Then it would graduate to a, a bigger story. So, hey, so here's the deal. I'm, I'm starting my practice and it's, you know, it's going to So take, this is to your family. Not, to family and friends. Not to you because you're a kid. Well, it started with me eventually, but yeah. at first it was, I didn't have money at first. And, but it would be like, hey, so I'm starting my practice. I need curtains for the office and blah, blah, And so that would encourage everyone. It's like, oh, it's his practice. He's gonna make even more money. Of course, I'm gonna get that money back. Right. Here you go. Um, and so that's what kept going. And then he would borrow from Peter to pay Paul, but then he wouldn't pay Paul. And now he'd owe Peter and Paul. She didn't use Colombian names? Uh, Pedro y Pablo. Okay. And then <laughs> he would start borrowing from me. And I had nothing, right? I would get like, an allowance, not from him. I would get like money from my my grandma when I would go see her, and and it was like very little money. But he's like, hey, uh, lend lend me there, like give me there. And again, it was like the sense of entitlement because. So how did you feel? Did you? Well, sense? at first it was the same thing. I felt like, well, yeah, that's my dad. He's a doctor. Whatever. Here's my money. Take whatever. You're my dad. So he hadn't blown his reputation yet. Not yet. Yeah. And not only that, he was always working on something, and he would always have this thing where he was treating patients pro bono because they had no money and that part was true but it was like this very chaotic situation where he was making no money anymore and whatever money he was getting he was blowing it all yeah you've mentioned that before i mean what's the evidence of that he did it and that it was extensive because that could have been a thing that he would have said do you know what i mean oh yeah no sure absolutely that could have been um so i i know for a fact that well the thing is that there were a few families that we knew as a family that were poor and they were lived in poor parts and they were always very kind and, and deferential to him okay. because he was helping them out and I, he is a good person in that sense it's just that he also had this problem and so it was this weird mixture of like yeah it, plus it helped his case in his own head he's like hey i'm a good person I think this society is corrupt. I think these politicians are all pigs, capitalist pigs. I think this is a mess. But I'm doing my part because I'm I'm treating these people for free. Even though I'm conning my family. Even though I'm conning my family for money because I'm, yeah, exactly. And he just couldn't see it, couldn't get out of it, couldn't pull up. And, 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 th and then he would just start flat out lying. That's when I started really like, well, that's not true. Because I would hear him say something. I'm like, what? Like what? That? Well, just like, like, he would say something like, hey, I need this for my office. But I'm like, he asked for that six months ago. The same thing. Uh, you know, things like that. Yeah. 
And then when I moved to the States, over time he started asking me for money and it'd be the same kind of thing. Like, okay, starting a new practice with my friend and I need blah. And I was like, oh, wow. absolutely. Get your life going. Here you go. And again, it was piddly, like here's 200 bucks or something. But you're a kid. I'm still a kid. And then I'm a young adult with barely any money. And then fast forward to now, you still give him money. Well, yeah. So eventually, you know, years later, I finally gave up on the illusion. Because, when, when did you give up on the illusion? Well, well into my 20s, I always thought that someday he was going to pull back up and eventually pay all of us back. Uh, of course, that was never going to happen. What was that like to kind of reckon with that fact? Um, it was very hard because when I was a kid, like you were saying earlier, like, yeah, it's like there's this part of you that just doesn't want to deal with it. Well, I didn't want to deal with it. Yeah. And like standing up to my dad, what would I have said? Like, you know how she in the documentary says like, what was I supposed to say? Yeah, I can relate to that. Like, what, uh, dad, uh, I think you're lying to everyone. Right. And the part that I want to point out as you're telling the story, which is interesting, I never knew this element. It's so, it's so interesting how many topics relate to your life, Berto. Everything revolves around me. Yeah. <laughs> well, you've been through a lot. And so yeah. the, the part that people don't think about with Sarma, with you, is you love this person. Yep. And you're also desperate for love from that person. Oh, absolutely. And when you think about confronting them, even in your mind, it's a separation that you cannot tolerate. Yeah. It's, it's antithetical to everything that you need. And, and to think about like, well, if I confront him, will he hate me? Will we talk yeah. ever again? What will, does this mean that he never loved me? You know, there's, right. there's all these questions that come up that are intolerable and it's just easier to just say, yeah, it'll be fine. Yeah. Here's another 200 bucks. It's just, especially the way, and, and I think the documentary kind of lays it out well. He didn't ask for $2 million. He asked for five grand, 10 grand. Same with Tinder Swimmer. Yeah. You know, it was always, and it's always funny to think about since it was always just him and his gambling problem. Yeah. It's interesting to think about his strategy because I was always a different number. Yeah. Know, well, remember the one part he's like, you got to get exactly $60,000. Yeah. So he was probably thinking, well, I owe 40 grand to this dude, but I'm going to need to make up this other 70,000 to this other guy. No, so if I, I ask for 60 grand, I can pay the 40, grab the 20, gamble it to make the 70 to pay off this guy. Well, <laughs> that, or I bet you she could come up with 60 right now. Yeah. And if I press, but I bet you she could come up with a hundred. But if I ask for a hundred, she'll really flip out. Yeah, so, yeah. I, so I bet you by now I could probably ask for. I bet you that's more the calculation, right? And I think I think there was something too. Like it's got to be exactly sixty. Like he, he probably well, made it, it was sound more official, his, right? Exactly. You know, it's, it's like, like it's not an arbitrary number. You know, it's, no. it's this is like all part of a thing. Yeah. Yeah. So the vulnerabilities that he capitalized on her, there were four that I could think of. Um, one was a fear of Leon dying, which yeah. I'll get more into later when I talk about her her personality as to why, and of course, no one wants their pet dog to die, but I think for her it was particular, which I'll get into later. Number two is her compassion and generosity. She clearly, independent of anything pr prior to Anthony, was a very generous right. and compassionate person the guy on the streets yeah i mean how many people like her from her world who look like her are that i mean not just nice yeah. but she became his friend he yeah. he could come into her home yeah. into her apartment you know like how many people yeah, are tough. like that um actually you're one of those people Berto. you you did you've done that before number 3 is the new age belief system, which we don't know if she had. One person just kind of threw it out. There. Yeah, it was that. Well, what was that guy's role? He was he like he, he was he, the Vanity Fair journalist. The Vanity Fair. Okay, because he's like, well, plus she was part of the whole vegan thing, and and I'm misquoting, but he's like, you know, those vegans. But essentially, he was saying, and maybe this isn't that unfair. There is some. If you're drawing Venn diagrams, there is some overlap between new age belief systems. Particularly and, back then. Uh, and back then, certainly when, absolutely. Yeah. And so the idea was, well, she might have been part of that circle. Right. And we don't know that, but could be. At the very least, she didn't have, like the Russian guy, a religious foundation upon which she could push back from. And, fair enough. At the same time, I feel like that had very little to do with this. <laughs> 
like in my in my opinion she the the psychology that made her vulnerable to this wasn't because she was a vegan or believed in new age things like do you know what i mean like they certainly didn't lay it out that way but it could have been a a because again if she was a strong christian or a strong atheist a strong anything other than new new because new age is so it's just so that you know it's so like open-ended to some extent because i'll go further in the sense that the beliefs he was laying out sounded way the heck more Catholic, like which, almost which extreme new age, Catholic, which New Age often can become. Anyway, the point is, yeah. is that she didn't have a strong belief system with that. You know, because if she was a part of a church or even a strong atheist, she could go to the church or she could go to other atheists and say, "What do you think about what my boyfriend's saying?" No, she, no, she I'm gonna call BS. <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't buy it, man. Because look, Q and Honors are like super Christian. Yeah. So I, I, I think. I'm not, look, I'm not saying that there isn't a correlation between people that are susceptible to belief in like cults are susceptible to belief in cults. I just didn't see any evidence that she was yeah. a cultist or yeah, you're right. whatever. Yeah, you're right. Certainly uh, the majority of cult victims have a strong religion because most people are strongly religious, you know? Yeah. Uh, and it's not like, okay, like when she was describing the things about it, it's it's not like she was like well you know I felt at first he was a little Saturnian but then I there was none of that language it yeah. was always just like I just don't know he seemed to be connected to some weird things and right right, right. in terms of that gaslighting progression it was I'm connected to the military okay there are people who are in the military that's not very strange yeah. I'm connected to special ops, like to, to, but not only special ops, but like some powerful, powerful people. people. Oh, yeah. okay. All right. Well, it's yeah. possible. I'm, you know, and then maybe there's a few other steps there. I'm in connection with this family that who is, who, who fight, who are like beyond the meat, yeah. the meat suit. And like she said, it was like Thor, <laughs> like yeah. Marvel superheroes. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. It was so weird because there was a brother and. <laughs> He's well, Loki. And, and and that was the other thing that made me like also think that, yeah, she actually wasn't, didn't fit that stereotype that the guy was saying so much because the fact that she was making that connection. Or did she do it later? And, no, it might have been. But either way, it, again, look, uh, we and I have, you and I have a friend in common that is very into the new age thing. And his whole language about approaching almost anything, it's immediately obvious because they use certain words, they use certain concepts, and they always bubble up. So we have a friend, a guy friend. That's... Yeah, a guy friend in common. Uh, I, I don't want to throw him under the bus, but huh. but basically, it'll be things about you know your inner energy and alignment with this, and uh, there's always some Eastern you know philosophy thing stuff. There was none of that in her yeah, conversation. Yeah, 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 yeah. The fourth thing, though, that I think was perhaps the most, uh, uh, the biggest part of our vulnerability to him and his particular brand of gaslighting is narcissism. Yeah. And I'm not talking about narcissistic personality, maybe yeah. maybe slight spectrum, but the, and I'll get more into her personality later on this front, but this notion that, she would be special you know there, her family kept talking about how she felt she always felt separate not only did you look at her and she, oh she feels separate from us but she thought of herself as being separate as right. being meant for something big and and her attraction to being in the limelight in this restaurant blah blah, blah. but this one conversation i think really i think it's hard to know what really was being communicated here but the conversation they had at the very end after this whole thing blows up in the courts and everything they talk on the phone and it's recorded uh, presumably by her it was like how the documentary starts right like that's when they're having that conversation um well it also played it at the end they're they're making a documentary about this no 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 this is this is this is at the very end oh the end okay yeah got it got it and 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 you're like wait Sarma talked to him after, after all this and yeah. anthony says you know he says um oh right when he, he calls her he's like how are you doing and he's like right. well not great you right. know? <laughs> and then at some point in the conversation he says in a long period of time i've been all over the world been in right. a, in all different places and met all sorts of people over a whole lot of years i love you 
you're the smartest person that I've ever met, okay? And you're the most beautiful thing. And she says, well, actually, she says something like, actually, she you're says, right about that. She says, it fucking pisses me off because you're right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that is a, that's an interesting exchange. Very interesting. Because in, when you look back at the gaslighting, it really was, there was a thread, a, a theme of, you're special. You're you know, going to be the boss. You know, that is very... So I caught that as well, but I, I didn't think of it in those terms. But I definitely found it odd because the takeaway from that conversation to me absolutely would not be, oh, I guess, yeah, that sucks that you're getting it right because I know that. Right. But yes, you're right. I am super smart and the best person you've met. Right. That's very interesting. Right. Yeah. So let's get into her personality here. <laughs> um so I'll get into, well, let's talk about avoiding attachment first. Because I think, I don't know, but I saw a lot of signs. One is that sh her she journaled a lot. And so avoiding attached people early in life give up on reaching out to other people. And one of the ways, and if taken to an extreme, they will stop emoting to other people. Mm. They'll stop reaching out. They will become very inner focused and they need to talk to someone but they don't really trust other people or they, and they, they don't even really think of other people as as people they can talk to yeah or as to be utilized that I way see. it's just other people you know why would i talk to someone else mm. and they go inward and they journal a lot so we saw that we also saw that she was super were, sorry were those the writings they kept showing is that actually like she was journaling is yeah that, okay got it and she became super atta attached to her pet dog, which can happen for... So you avoid and attach people out there, particularly you moderate to severe. There are many different presentations because it literally comprises of like a third of the population or something, maybe you know a quarter. Uh, I bet you some of you can relate to this in that you, you don't ask for help. You don't talk to other people when you're suffering. You either consciously understand that other people aren't going to be there or you just don't really think of it you don't yeah. think to even reach out or you consider it a weakness or something but deep down you have a lot of attachment needs that are not being met because you're suppressing it all mm. but then you come across a pet and they <laughs> the pet needs you you know or yeah. a child honestly you could have a child as well but particularly a pet a pet and all of a sudden you are like oh my God, I'm a dog person <laughs> or I'm a cat person. And you start having those bumper stickers that say, um, the only human I like on the planet is my dog or something. Like that. <laughs> and uh, if that isn't a bumper sticker, it should be. But the feelings come pouring out because you don't associate neglect yeah. and coldness with the dog. One, because it's a different species. And two, because dogs are just so unabashedly in love with you usually and so for some avoided people and we kind of saw that with her like the only person she seemingly showed consistent yeah. attention and attachment to was the was dog. her dog yeah. and then she becomes so desperately connected because it's the only relationships in her maybe entire life that she's ever been truly vulnerable and open with do, do you imagine that she started showing anxiety around her dog's health and that he capitalized or do you think he just like intuited that maybe yeah living forever was something that she might be interested in probably door number two yeah. um the dog is i actually looked it up the dog's still around alive yeah. so the dog must have been pretty young yeah and probably didn't have medical problems right at the so time. it's kind of that's one thing i found very odd was like Look, I've had pets. We, we've talked about this. We both had pets die, and yeah. it's tragic. It's super sad. Um, I certainly wouldn't have felt that I would have been that vulnerable to someone coming along saying, "Hey, by the way, I can make your pet live forever." Yeah, you know, especially when they're young and you don't, you know. But if, and it, I think they painted it pretty well. The severe attachment yeah. that she had with her right. pet. Um, Another kind of a very loose speculative hypothesis is around neurodivergence, either autistic, gifted, sensitive, something. Uh, she exhibited some people with those 
differences can sometimes be very, they can become loners because they don't feel like they relate to other people very well. I wanted to ask you about that because in the, now it's hard to tell, you know, obviously we're not seeing the whole gamut, but both in the interviews, in the recordings, in the descriptions from other people, she's kind of, she's very muted. Yeah. Right. So it could be avoiding attachment, which, you know, that's, it could be part of that. It could be either or, and, you know, um, autism, giftedness, uh, you know, a variety of other things. Yeah. Uh, it could be other kinds of personality issues that result in being, you know, like there's OCPD, there's other personality disorders that can cause people to be very blunted in terms of their emotional expression. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we heard from her sister that she was always that way. Yeah. To the point right. where the sister said, I had to do the talking for her. Yeah, right, right, right. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's true. So there's something about her that is, you know, particular. And I think that also played into this whole thing. And then now getting to narcissistic spectrum is the rules don't apply to her was mentioned. Right. The feeling of being separate, you know, quiet superiority likes being on stage you know she took to the fame of the restaurant very well right um but lacked closeness behind the scenes driven to achieve perhaps entitled and and a lot of her selfies seemed i mean i know people take selfies i take selfies yeah. but there was something about her selfies that were very particular she was mm. always she was never smiling <laughs> yeah yeah exactly <laughs> and there were many of them yep you know well th so I, I was mentioning that she ended up having this affair with her lawyer as they were doing law their trial and stuff which he, he that was certainly unethical of him um uh not to mention he was married and stuff like that but uh, they show i read through the exchanges the text messages and it's the same thing like he'd be like saying some really hot and heavy stuff and then she'd reply with a very plain reply uh a, a honestly there might have been an element of like she she felt like she wanted to do this to try to see if she could get something out of the like a better lawyer out of the deal essentially is that what, is that the allegation well what i feel is he was using his power that way yeah and she might have been vulnerable to so, it so it's not but in either case her responses were like not enthusiastic at all yeah, right <laughs> so which leads me to the last a speculation which seems to have a fair amount of evidence which is a lack of connection with self which yeah. would fit in with narcissistic spectrum and avoidant attachment uh there were three different data points one is is that she's at upenn and she's studying econ and someone's like the way this is her story someone comes up to her and is like do you like this field yeah. and she's like and sh she says no one ever asked me that question. Yeah. She didn't say. She, she didn't ask herself that question. And she didn't answer the question. Yeah. She didn't say yes or no. And then the other person gauged her response and said, well, you seem to be really interested in food. <laughs> and then she became, yeah. then she dropped out a year later and became right. trained as a chef. And none of that screams, I want X. It screams, I don't know what I want. Yeah. You know, and so that's a lack of connection with self. Now, at the same time, you know, she started that company with clearly had a vision for it. Not only did she have a vision well, for the core restaurant, but she had that expansion and she she was talking about how she really wanted to take it international and all these things and well, it's hard so yeah, and it's not like a lack of connection with self means you can't have any decisions, but even those decisions, she fell in love with a att very attractive chef yeah. guy that she was interviewing for for something. And she, then she gets wrapped up in, in That's his That's true. World. That is a he, fact. Yeah. They start the restaurant. <laughs> yeah. How much of that was him? Sure. Which, you know what I mean? So I'm not saying she's vapid or somehow not responsible for success, but that little detail. The other thing was about getting married. I mean, getting married for most people is a pretty big deal. And I think it is right. to her too. And she married, the way she describes the marriage is, well, he was promising to give me $2 million to get me out of debt. And I was asking the accountant, well, uh, am I going to have to pay taxes on that? And the account, she, this is her story. The accountant jokingly yep. said, well, if you get married, you don't have to pay taxes. Yep. And so we got married. Yeah. That doesn't sound like someone 
that because there's an because if, if you had it I, if if i heard someone with a connection with self they would have said oh and then i thought well this isn't how i ever wanted to get married no right <laughs> and but i did it anyway because i was so desperate you know, right instead it was just very transactional yeah it was like, just like oh yeah. okay let's get married you know that when you are lacking a connection with the self yeah you don't have anything to guide you you just have like vague logic which isn't usually how ma people make decisions like this yeah. you know so and she was easily victimized when you don't have a connection with yourself and you don't have a foundation someone else can come along and create one right. for you and, that, and that's why i was suggesting that it, it felt to me from both reading the article and reading through the text it was like oh wow this person's vulnerable because this guy comes along he's cl clearly clearly an unscrupulous lawyer and like you know, hot shot. He's defended a lot of scumbags too. Like he's uh -huh. one of those, and he he just like got what he wanted out of her. Yeah, she doesn't. You know, it's just sad. so. Let's talk about Anthony. So what we know about him from the documentary and other reports that I read: father was alcoholic, abusive, police officer with a gambling problem. Threat at least once threatened to murder suicide in front of Anthony that it was a confrontation with a gun that lasted several hours with Anthony watching right there. As an adult, the father and Anthony lived in a van and would travel around to different casinos. That was something that I don't think yeah. was in the documentary. The uh, brother said Anthony was obsessed with money and power but didn't want to put any work into it from an early age. By the way, is his actual real name Anthony? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Anthony uh, Stranges. Okay. Um, so she still called him Shane a lot <laughs> and then also Anthony yeah and then yeah. Christopher and da 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 yeah but so what diagnosis do we give him Berto you should know by is, has have I educated you on nothing and I've already said it or no I mean I, I think he was a psychopath or he is a psychopath right he's a yeah. classic presentation of Hare's conceptualization of psychopathy yeah um, so let's go through the criteria uh, the first category is pathological lying and manipulation without any remorse or guilt. Constant and easily. Constant, just constant lying. Yeah. And when people talk about like, oh, you know, Chris Pratt's a psychopath because of that tweet. It's like, come on, people. No, watch this documentary. That's a psychopath. Yeah. That is, I mean, he probably lied 10,000 million times. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was, it was constant. Um, he lied about everything uh, and, and total lack of remorse or guilt, total callousness and total failure to take responsibilities for, for his own actions. It's just classic psychopathic in that way. Feeling another category is feeling superior and entitled, obsessed with power and intimidating people with your narcissistic rage when people get in your way. Did he do that, bro? Well, there's certainly evidence in the documentary. There, there are uh, more than one occasion where he ex explicitly says to someone, you know, it, like there's the, the homeless guy who's like, oh, you know, he was trying to be there for her. And he's like, I got, I, I'm taking care of her. Right. And, and according to the, by the way, that homeless guy seemed like a tough dude, you know. Yeah. He was even telling the cops, like, you can't stop me from getting that done. Yeah. He said he's never felt more like scared scared yeah. like that's and then there was a couple other times where where he was like that not to mention he was essentially either implicitly or explicitly constantly implying to her that he was capable of really bad stuff right yeah, yeah. and also felt entitled to all her money totally. all of her mom's money all yeah. of the business's money all the investors like totally and his language was about rules don't apply to him or the family he's part of right. you know and and this is the part that I also, again, I keep hammering on this in every time we talk about this. Psychopaths are messy. Psychopaths are stupid. Psychopaths make mistakes because they have a personality disorder. That's the definition. Yeah. If it's a strength, then it wouldn't be a personality disorder. Right. He's got a gambling problem that is compulsive and uncontrollable. Yeah. He, he basically ruined his cash cow. Yeah. He drove it to the ground. So if... He was even slightly intelligent about this whole thing. He would have dialed back his gambling a tad. Just a tad. And 
latched himself, married a woman who who liked him, or he was already married to her, so he could have said, I'm just going to drain a little bit of money off Which, of her. Which, by the way, with that restaurant then expanding with right. the juice bar and stuff, a little bit could have been a million dollars a month or something. Like, right. who knows? Yeah. Like, the, <laughs> like yeah, you, you, you project her business into the future. Yeah. It could have been gigantic. Yeah. But psychopaths are going to psychopath, yeah. and they always crash and burn because there's yeah. they're there's something different about their brain that they can't yeah. make decisions you know uh, another category is irresponsibility lack of realistic long term goals impulsiveness criminal versatility uh, and a parasitic lifestyle did he exhibit this category bro absolutely uh yeah. he was living off of her and her mom um he was uh, as far as the criminal versatility, this one I always get tripped up about because, like, we've so you know, it's but. it's crimes. Usually, if someone isn't a psychopath, they will their crimes that they commit will be in one category. Mm. You know, they do all robberies. I see. When you're a psychopath, you are an opportunist when it comes to crime. Yeah. So you will commit crimes all over the place right that don't really seem to be in one category yeah probably although i guess there's not enough accounts of like and then he stole from right. this store and then he, yeah i mean know. the hair model is based on prisoners but yeah. we can certainly look at his even just a few of his crimes and see that there's versatility he impersonated a police officer that's right he yeah, impersonated a, a military person <laughs> yeah. he defrauded all these people um, oh, getting back to the entitlement, he felt entitled to the restaurant and, and that superiority, right. like I can, even though he knew nothing about anything, thought he could run the, the restaurant better than she could. Absolutely. And, and, you know, he did do wire frauds, mail frauds, email, like, you know, cyber yeah. crimes, like right. all sorts of things in yeah. that sense. And served no time in prison, no time. which I find yeah. odd. Um, early behavior problems, uh, juvenile delinquency. Uh, we have some evidence of that given accounts, but not a lot. A need for stimulation. This is another category mm -hmm. of psych psychopathy that I think is overlooked. Sexual promiscuity, poor behavioral controls. Did he exhibit this sort of thing? I think the gambling alone is one of those. Uh, he he was he he was constantly there. He was addicted to it. He had systems in yeah. place. All these things. But more importantly, he played Call of Duty. That right there is. <laughs> But eating as well. It looked like he had an eating Oh, issue. that's true. He ate a lot. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. And then shallow affect, um, which we don't know because we couldn't – it didn't really seem like that was a strong one. But, but when people met him, they found him to be off-putting, which is – which is frequent for psychopaths. You can just like, something's wrong with that person. You know? But he had – I don't know if this one's coming up. He had the whole glib uh, – the yeah. glib kind of charm in a sense remember at the beginning when they were introducing him right. he was like buddy buddies on on uh, twitter with alec baldwin or something <laughs> yeah well that's part of the pathological lying <laughs> yeah yeah of, right? um and i want to be clear that this is not narcissistic personality disorder yeah it's much he's much easier conceptualized as a classic psychopath yeah and to uh you know address all the articles talking about how he's an example of a narcissist i'm just gonna say no <laughs> like uh you don't understand at least you can call him narcissistic i suppose yeah like he's self-centered okay sure but to invoke the dsm uh, language and the kind of clinical literature that goes back 100 years on narcissism he's not that kind of narcissist D don't wouldn't psychopaths in general come across as narcissistic? Yeah, it's a part of the. Yeah. So it's also with borderline. Yeah, it's yeah. also it's several of the yeah. personality disorders can come across as quote unquote narcissistic in that right. one you're self centered and you are kind of in love with your own thoughts out of desperation or just because. But but yeah, there, there's. But you're also burying the lead if you're like, well, he's a narcissistic personality. It's like, it, it's like yeah. imagine saying that about you know a Ted Bundy. It's like, yeah. well, sure. Yeah. Can we talk about the more important problem? Here? Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now, when we get to the Ted Bundys of the world, you start getting into like, like he's got all of the above kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, you, you could start to say half and half, like yeah. psychopathy, but and but still, sadism like, and, yeah. 
Right. <laughs> yeah. But but the thing that the internet thinks is that narcissism, the label is used for any human being that is a jerk face. And so the more of a jerk face you are, which yeah. Anthony clearly is, then he must be narcissistic. There's just they just have one word for jerk face, which is narcissistic, you know, and it's just like that's not how we see it. And then, you know, the other thing, in addition to psychopathy, is that he had a lot of attachment insecurity. And I think that he exhibited that through his relationship with with uh Sarma. Yeah, it didn't I mean he had a terrible relationship with his father, right? They threatened to kill each other multiple times. Yeah. And then his dad uh, was a criminal too, right? Yeah. So. Well, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Um, and by the way, like the story of the abused mother, Anthony's mother, calls the cops, mm -hmm. of which Anthony's father, John, is a police officer for. They don't help the family and, in, and just tell... John, the father, you know, your wife called saying that yeah. she's a victim of abuse. John comes home, rips the, you know, beats her more and rips the phone out of the wall. Like, oh, right, right. He puts, what, what is it? He puts his dad in jail. Oh, wait, no, this is a different thing. I got confused. I watched a, do you know this whole, um, the, uh, this a YouTube series where this guy interviews all these very down and out people? Yeah. Yeah. So in one of those, the guy was talking about, so the story I actually was reached out to them and, Asked for permission to the react. Soft white underbelly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and he gave me permission to react to his video. I didn't need to ask for his permission, yeah. but I just felt like I should. But I haven't done it yet because, and people will sometimes send me those videos to react to, but I find myself thinking, I think I'm just going to react by saying, yeah, there you go. That's that. You know what I mean? It's a tough one because um, it's an individual. And like, I have. I think what he's doing is valid and valuable, but it does border the documentary. on the documentary. Yeah, but okay. it does border on exploitation. Exploitation. Yeah. So, it, anyways, but I didn't want to derail. It's just that for a second I got confused with one of those people's stories. Yeah. But in this case, what was what you just said that they called the cops? So the story that was in the article in Vanity Fair, in the documentary, and also in other news reports was that. The father, John, Anthony's father, when Anthony was young, uh, was abusive to the mom. And when she confronted him saying, I want to leave you, mm. he got his gun, put it to her head, and put the gun in her mouth Ugh. and says, I'm going to kill you, I'm going to kill the kids, I'm going to kill myself. Okay, I remember that now. Yeah. Anthony is there, and I, I'm guessing trying to talk him down or something. Uh this goes on for hours apparently the she calls the cops afterwards right the cops tell him because he's a fellow cop he comes home abuses her rips the phone out of the wall yeah this is the, the ex-wife was telling this story anthony's ex-wife was oh, okay. telling this story in the documentary oh, okay now, now i remember yeah this is horrible i mean that's yeah. horrible yeah so on it's so many levels obvious that anthony like, if endured, that happened the whole police department should be burned to the ground and started afresh. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, yeah. what are you there for? <laughs> so it's, it's, it's clear that Anthony had a, 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 bad, whole, a bad role model. A whole bad set of yeah. experiences. And perhaps genetics to boot. Yeah. So the aftermath, people are supporting her. People are neutral on her. And of course, people are making fun of her. For example... People on the internet are like, ha, 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 immortal dog. Like, actually, Stacy actually sent me this parody commercial trailer for mm -hmm. the documentary that was, or it was a parody of maybe the religion that Anthony was proposing. Okay. And it was like all these shots of people with their dogs and enjoying their dogs, and they're like, you know, would you like your dog? Do you love your dog? Do you want it to live forever? And then they're like, you know, yeah. Anthony stirred you know, strangest system or something. Yeah. And so that's pretty awful. But it's also dumb because uh, this isn't like a thing where th it was a whole compound of people and he actually had a system. He was ad hoc making up crap right. to, uh, to abuse and exploit her. Right. It, it, this isn't a real, so fine, you know, you can make fun of whatever you want, but... I, I miss the point because 
You well, know, it reduces uh, years and years of gaslighting abuse and emotional torment and torture emotionally to ha 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 he promised her he was gonna make her dog immortal and and tricked her ha 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 i agree at the same time you know the, people have made fun of the railians and all the things like actually i'm poking fun at the fun because i'm saying yeah this isn't that like you missed the story this isn't about some weird cult with rules and things. No, that's not what this story is. Right. This story is one guy making up random stuff as he goes along to try to manipulate someone to, for his own gambling needs. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Another person on Twitter said, hippie lady, hippie lady got scammed. Boo hoo. What do you think about that one? Well, yeah, that's, that, that shows a lack of care. I mean, look, should we say that if you're going to devote your daily... Uh, emotional meters to something maybe you should care about bigger problems yeah fine 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 if you don't want to watch the documentary about one instance of this no problem but it's not like she wasn't a victim <laughs> like and i don't i guess i don't see the point of making fun of her she was yeah. a victim yeah the thing to ask yourself out there if she hadn't met him where would she be today she was yeah would she have defrauded investors? No. <laughs> no. Would she have been on the run from the law? No. no. She did everything uh, because of the abuse that she went through, went against all of her instincts. She didn't have any inkling in that direction. No. There Absolutely. was nothing in her behavior indicated she was oriented towards scamming the system. <laughs> yeah. And so the... Uh, it's, so you just have to ask yourself, but but you have to believe and understand that humans, even people who are smart and privileged, can become broken down over time emotionally, which yeah. which can happen to anyone, including Sarma, including you out there, including me. Uh, I can be victimized that way if if under the right circumstances. Yeah, like it could happen to you. another person. Says the most puzzling thing is why do these women just give their men this money? Uh, is this a thing you do if you have money? I would never give a man money. If the cashier at the store is a man, I simply do not pay. <laughs> okay. What do you think about that tw <laughs> That tweet, bro? I, I mean, come on. <laughs> that's, just, that's just ridiculous. Like, first of all, me think the person doth complain too much. Like, I find that a lot of times the more extreme the comments, the more you probably actually are a victim of whatever it is you're complaining about. Mm -hmm. But in general, of people, this happens to people all the time. I just gave an example from my life in my family. People have stories like this in their families all over the place. Now, not everything is as extreme. The reason I was giving the example earlier of years ago, I lent my buddy a thousand bucks and didn't see it for like two years is because more often than not, that's what we're talking about is like small little defraudings like this. This one made bigger news and it was a documentary because it was for millions and millions of dollars in a very prominent New York thing and blah, blah, blah. Still, she is a victim. And still, people give money to people when they shouldn't or, or you know, and they're, they're being taken advantage of all the time to, to pretend like she's the one human being who was stupid. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. And it makes people reckon with their own vulnerability and the fact that women are current and people and a lot of women are being abused right now by people like this uh, i've had clients who have gone through very similar situations like this actually and it's horrific uh it i mean god help you if you ever come across one of these individuals like anthony i mean you can't help who you swipe right on you can't help who you kind of like after the fifth date you can't like you can't control who you fall in love with after the 30th date and psychopathic people like this they can hold it together for 30 dates you know there's also this aspect um psychopaths uh, abusers child molesters all these things um there is usually they find victims because they they're probing around the edges and a lot of times the people that are most vulnerable are the first to show some give and then they just push into that. Right. So, okay, so maybe she's more vulnerable than the average person. I'm not saying this is the fact, but let's pretend for a second she's more vulnerable than the average person to being uh, taken advantage of. 
is that something to celebrate? Is that something to make fun of? Right. Like, do we make fun of someone because they can't run as fast because their leg has been injured since or they were born? Or a 10 year old who's groomed like, by an uncle or something? No. It's like, so like, if anything, yeah. if she actually has some either emotional issue, whatever, shouldn't we be even more like respectful and empathetic to, to that condition? Yeah. Let alone that there's no evidence that that's the case. More likely than not, he could have defrauded nine out of 10 people that were that he was trying to defraud because he was very good. He's yeah. a very good defrauder. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, it would be hard not to fall for it, particularly if you don't have the wherewithal, which most, which most people don't. And I hope that by watching these documentaries, people have more wherewithal to protect themselves from these psychopaths. Another person says, there's no way this woman graduated from Wharton, ran a multi-million dollar business in New York City, and is as fucking stupid and clueless as she's trying to make out. I'm not buying it. She's a bad liar, not a bad vegan. What do you think of that, bro? So Bernie Madoff only defrauded stupid, uh, ungraduated people. Right. Uh, Enron was always, uh, you know, like this was one of my beefs with you several, many, many episodes ago. Uh -oh. But it, it's not longer with you. It's just, we have this well, weird... Well, I'm just going to preemptively say that you're wrong and I'm right. <laughs> Probably. We have this weird notion where it's like, uh, you know, big, b successful business people. They're very smart and stuff like that. Yeah, and a lot of them are con artists. <laughs> Honestly, she clearly had skills at selling ideas, at, at putting together a successful business and things like that. Her weaknesses were not in those areas. Um, and, and, and not buying, I also don't understand what we're not buying. Are we claiming this didn't happen? Are we claiming the restaurant wasn't really a restaurant? Are we claiming, it, like, which part of it are we not buying? Right. It, it, like, I don't, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I find it to be problematic on so many levels. It's anti-victim. It's patriarchal. It's denying human frailty. And I won't stand for it, bro. Side note to end with. Louis C.K., did you know she, he was involved? Yes, so that's what, I, yes, she dated him too. <laughs> so let me go through that. Yeah. So reportedly, they dated in 2012, which would have been maybe just before Anthony or during Anthony. I'm, I don't know, because I think, anyway. And there was an email exchange between the two of them that has been made public about her saying, quote, I'm upset and freaked out because you gave me a, a, an, an STD. An STD. I, I don't know. If it was, I think it was it HPV or was it? Um, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, a, anyway. Uh, and he replied. So this is after she says, I have been I've tested positive for an STD. And I think you gave it to me because you have this STD. Yeah. And he says, hey, I understand you're upset. This is. This kind of shit is tough. I never swore that I was clean. I told you I may or may not have given this to you. I'm sorry if I did. If you gave it to me, it's okay. We all share the current human bloodstream, which includes this kind of stuff. I should have worn a condom. You should have made me. We should have had a lot of things. We are human. What do you think of this so far, Berto? Uh, not too much. I... I It'd be easy for me to say, oh, that Louis C.K., I knew, you know, but people give each other STDs all the time, so I don't know. So you can kind of relate to what he's saying? I've never knowingly had or given an STD. I mean, well, what do you think of this? That, and, I, you know, and I'm not leading the witness here. Yeah. I, I just, I'm just i really curious. I should have worn, worn a condom. You should have made me. We should have done a lot of things. If, if, if you hadn't told me who this is, for example, you're like, hey, this is an ex-boyfriend. Here's the exchange. My honest thoughts would be, well, that sucks. Now, it's possible that he lied and told her, no, I don't have an STD. And then he knew that he did, in which case that's horrible. That is, that should, that, that should, that's criminal. If that's not the case, and from the exchange it sounded like it wasn't, but he could be lying, then yeah, I don't know. It's like, it yeah, could it's, be hard, like, it's well, hard to tell, right? It's, yeah. Because on, there's, a, there's a possibility that they had had a conversation prior to having sex where he's like, I have an STD and there's a chance I'm going to give it to you but I don't think I'm going to give it to you or something like that. Yeah. And so if that's the case, then, and he wasn't lying, then, and Google is one Google away, yeah. uh, then 
she, you know, they entered into a risk and she rolled the dice and it came up, you know, snake eyes for her. It is just at the same time very, you know, inconvenient and suspicious. He's <laughs> like, that we, Louis C.K. had very negative press around him because of his relationships with women. Well, he coerced people in social situations. Right. And so he, this he basically does, sexually assaulted. This certainly does not add good right. data. There. He goes on to say, our generation has this stuff. The next generation will all be inoculated and will have sex with electric glass penises and digital vaginas, and they'll get software viruses instead. It's a part of life. I've been told the same thing that there's no good test for guys and even that condoms don't stop this shit. I don't know. It's a mess. I hope you're okay. I think... So, according to that, saying that there's no good test for guys, I think that's the um, HP human papilloma virus. So, the, the second half of this has now made me turn my opinion because I know he's a comedian, but wrong time to make these right. kind of jokes. Yeah. And And now I'm starting to think... Oh, wait a minute. No, I think he knew. <laughs> I yeah. think he knew very clearly. And then he says, I hope you're okay. I think you will be. And I'm sorry. I still look back tenderly and happily on our time together. And that night, it was really wonderful, even though it never happened again. And it seemed to be sort of a stopping point for us, unfortunately. So from that, it sounds like it was a one night stand. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's hard to know. I, the, the question would be, did she no and did he tell her or was it did he not or was it somewhere in between yeah and if it if it is hpv i also have heard that there there's a lot of stigma around this because like you know tons of humans have it and people are like you know what am i supposed to do hi nice to meet you oh just so you know i have hpv right like it's it's a hard thing but at the same time if you do have it, it's your responsibility to let the other person know before you have sex with them. Right. I mean, so. the ethics, and we I've been talking about this on the podcast for over a decade, is one, you get tested yeah. to find out. And two, you absolutely tell people absolutely as soon as them. risk yeah. arises. The fact that we have a society that's stupid about the stigma is not the fault of your partner. Right, right. <laughs> so if we want to push back on the stigma, then fine. But... Um, and I understand the shame. I understand the reticence to disclose. I understand the denial, but you have to reckon with your responsibility. Um, two months after the email exchange, his TV show, you know, Lou, Louis, in yeah. which he writes the episodes. And I, I didn't watch that show very much, but I did see this episode. Mm, was there which, an episode about HP? In which a small blonde woman was discovered to have an STD. What? And calls him, and, and, is, and they had a one-night stand. Oh, my gosh. He writes what he knows. That yeah, and he calls, calls and, and then they have a whole exchange about, you know, who's yeah. responsible, and it's very depressing in the Louis that makes C. Sense. K kind of way. Okay, Bert, a final word on... Bat oh, Actually, I forgot to ask you about this. So when, okay, so the, the, the tagline in the news, if you knew anything about this story when it came out in 2015, was, uh, you know, prominent, beautiful, high-end vegan is on the run because she defrauded her employees and they caught her because the of pizza. Because of <laughs> Domino's, it, but it's Domino's pizza. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so- all the headlines and all the jokes and all the right. tweets about, oh, she, you know, she's a terrible human being and she, yeah. she has she's dominance. a bad vegan. <laughs> yeah, and I find that uh, the stigma around vegans is is just so stupid. It's well, it, the thing that was actually, I'm glad you brought this up. I was I was remembering that I was going to bring this up. Um, I'm surprised the title worked now. I can understand the title working maybe even five years ago, but now every everywhere you go, someone's got a vegan option. Now vegans kind of like a, uh, a lot of people are so, into it. So Seattle is a pretty big vegan town, yeah, compared particularly to the rest of the world. But as a non-vegan myself, I I don't know of of the restaurants that I go to. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there are any vegan options. You, of course, can zero in on them. Right. But 
Okay, so I have some self selection. And bias. you might be literally the only vegan I know. <laughs> okay, and I know dozens of people. Right. Yeah. So, so especially when we start thinking about like you know Spokane, Washington, and well, and around so the world. you're. I, I, I see now from your perspective. And in that your makes world, sense. everything's vegan, but that's because it's your but world. At right? the same time, and so I, I see what you're saying. At the same time, when I started being vegan was about six years ago, and at the time. It was certainly, I felt like a foreign invader. Everyone made fun of me constantly. Everywhere I Did went. Did I ever make fun of you? I, I don't know, but like. I can't imagine making fun of you. I don't know if you made explicit fun, but it's just everyone made little funny, little snide comments. Some people way more. Because I, I knew you were doing it because of health concerns. Health, sure. Yeah. But and everywhere that, I went. You were pretty afraid of what was happening to your body. Yeah, so. and everywhere I went, I couldn't find good options. Yeah. Since then, the world has changed. When I go up to most places, I can easily order. Like bean burgers and impossible burgers are everywhere. I'm not saying those are necessarily healthy. I'm just saying the world has changed. So because of that, when I saw the title, I'm like, what? I also then thought that veganism was going to play a much bigger role in the right. story. Yeah, I, I do kind of <laughs> fault the title a little bit. But I think they were trying to... Uh, jump off of what people remember about the tagline, but yeah. I don't remember this story coming out at the time. No, know? I d I never heard of this, and even the sensational of like vegan caught with pizza. Um, by the way, as a as a vegan person, I also I'm vegan plus in that I make exceptions as needed. Uh, a a cheese pizza is like a vegetarian option, right? <laughs> the, the thing that me and Stacy, you know, we turn to each other and we're like. Vegans sometimes don't eat vegan, yeah, you know, exactly. it, it, like, but the the stigma that I want to highlight, which I think is maybe obvious to everyone, but I feel like I need to highlight it, which is that when vegetarianism became a thing, when veganism became a thing, there is this, I, I would say, this, there's this notion to non-vegans that the vegans think of themselves as superior. And they're looking down at the carnists. Right? I felt that way constantly. I used to. I used to think vegetarian. Like I remember feeling internally very annoyed and like kind of upset. I, I would go to a lunch and someone, actually one of my friends, would would order a thing, and I'm like, oh, it's, it's like, well, I'm a vegetarian or whatever. And I remember internally, I'd be like, that's annoying. Really? Oh yeah. And like, what's that based on? I don't know because I grew up in a culture that was so like meat and potatoes. And God, stuff. I'll say when I went to Bogota with you, we went to your uh, grandma's yeah. 90th, 91st birthday, or whatever. Yeah. And <laughs> it was like they, they always talk about like Brazilian barbecue. Sure. <laughs> Colombia, you know, Brazil's got nothing on Colombia. I mean, Colombia, it's just there yeah. was the, there was this. Mass and as a carnist myself, I was in heaven, but there's this hum I mean, there are a lot of people at this birthday party, but the amount of meat. <laughs> there was so many meat things. I mean, it was it, every type. Every type. Sausage and yeah. brisket and steak yeah. and chicken and seafood. Yeah. And, and then every once in a while, you'd see a little potato. <laughs> yeah. So coming from that, I thought, I was like, what the hell? Anyone that was gluten-free or anyone who asked for a substitution at a restaurant. But I'm I trying to understand why like, you would Ugh. get annoyed with it. Like, what's the I, what's okay, the threat? I don't know. I don't know. I think... Was okay, it an let assumption let that they're looking down on you? It. Yes. I think there was... Pro okay. You know what? At the time, I, I didn't eat healthy. I used to eat a lot of crap. So, I probably felt judged in the moment, even though no one was, right? I probably was like, oh... I see how it is. But no one was judging me. I was judging myself, right? right? Number one. Number two, there was something about it like... Yeah, just to, sorry, just yeah. to highlight that. I think that a lot of the anti-veganism, anti-vegetarianism is an inner voice yeah. that is nagging the individual right. that they project onto yeah. the other person. I could see that. And then the second thing is, there was something about it like, why do you have to be so difficult? <laughs> Why can't you just do what everyone else does? Yeah, which I think is just general conformist uh, uh, sort of themes. But also, when we're growing up, in my family anyway, yeah. 
No, certainly. I, I know you, where you're going. <laughs> if you complained. Yep. So in my family, you know, there were four kids. Yeah. And just the contra I'll give you I'll give you the exception which will explain the rule. One time in my life, out of eighteen years of every and my family ate dinner at five thirty yeah. every <laughs> night at the same table from the time I was before I was born until well after I was you know, moved out of the house. Every night. No exception. We didn't. We didn't travel. We traveled right. maybe a week out of. So, it was every night, every night. five thirty uh, on the dot, and so one time I was served a dish. And my mom will admit this that she was not a good cook because she got <laughs> she got pregnant at nineteen oh, and was in a sorority at the time and hadn't you know oh, learned no. how to cook so. They so and my parents eloped and okay. and my mom had and she was sort of the princess in this rich family my mom and had learned nothing about how to cook and so she basically had like five to eight dishes that she would rotate and all of them were bad except for one <laughs> that she still makes which I which I like but anyway and she'll admit that but and she's since been so, a lot better but anyway there there was one of those dishes and this one night I was probably like twelve or something and I was just like. <sighs> do we have could i like eat something else and i thought i was gonna get you know major punishment by just sign just by even asking I, or i don't even know what i said i can't yeah. I, I can't picture myself saying that i must have indicated something like some sort of displeasure which i also can't imagine given how our, my household was but anyway my mom said to me well if you want to make yourself a, P, a pb and j sandwich go mm -hmm. for it and so i was like Really? Really? And so I made a PB and J sandwich and I ate it and I was on cloud nine. I'm oh. like, I didn't have to eat that dinner. I <laughs> ate my own like creation. <laughs> that happened once. One time. Out of you know, okay. three hundred sixty five <laughs> times eighteen. <clears throat> so so and which <clears throat> makes total sense. You know, my mom and dad both worked and by my mom worked less over time, but she's cooking for six people every day. And you can't have, and we're also on a massive budget. I mean, my family was not rich. And so she had to cook these giant things in a vat, literally, this humongous yeah. pot on the thing. And, you know, kids complain, particularly when they're young. And so at an early age, my parents just said, you will not complain. You systematize what you can. because yeah. <laughs> There will be no complaining yeah. in this house about food. You will not only not complain, you will thank your mom every day. Yeah. Because you will be a respectful, grateful right. person. There are starving kids around this world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're being fed. You will not complain and you will eat it. And that would also translate into politeness when we'd go to other people's houses. Right. When we were given food, you know, and there's a lot of strange food in Japanese, totally. Asian homes. There's like a lot of odd jars of things. And that was another <laughs> thing that my parents would tell us, like, you will not scat you know scoff at food you will eat it and you will like it and you will shut up and, <laughs> and i don't want to hear anything i love and it <laughs> it basically just turned me into this vacuum of food like i will eat anything i, I love it i no, listen i can 100 percent relate. so, so 100%. when someone would say i'm picky about food yeah i always have this inner voice yeah. of you narcissistic self-entitled yeah. picky baby you, you know? hit it on the head like that's what it is for me I, I can totally relate to you. So I had two options for dinner every night. Do you know what they were? Uh, two options. Rice and beans. I could either finish the dinner with the family or oh. I could finish the dinner by myself. <laughs> yeah. Those are my two options. Stay every at the, meaning stay night. At the, you have to stay at the table. Yeah, till I finish. Yeah, same me. Every Ex night. Yeah, same Every me. night, chicken. Yeah. Chicken. Breast chicken. Every single night. Breast chicken. How do you want to cook tonight? No, same way. Wait. Every single night night why that's what my grandma made for dinner every night every night just every chicken. night breast chicken look with with what on the side oh, like look, rice on the side? Uh, yeah now the sides varied slightly so there was a rice and then there was maybe a lentil and then one day maybe it was a, a red bean right was it dry the, the chicken the chicken it was slightly moist i won't say it was <laughs> terrible oh, okay it was good it had a but a nice taste but every single how night you i mean colombia has a rich culinary i know, I know. It was just again a system. She had five kids, you know, growing up, and then uh, then now she had my but dad, why not like, me, like chicken her, stew. my grandpa, and my uh, my aunt. And so, 
I don't, now I'm not saying look at Christmas there was a special thing and but man that's 360 rough. I did not know three that. days out of the year I mean you've been abused you've talked about <laughs> abuse that's awful. chicken why do you think I don't, I don't want chicken anymore but anyways so I can relate to that and again I had to finish my food I can't complain are you kidding me yeah when we go to places like a, a relative's house and they serve me food I can't compl- there's no complaining in baseball yeah so I think you're right. I would sit there and if someone was like, do you have the vegetarian option? I'd be like internally like, oh my gosh. You picky, entitled, you? narcissist. Exactly. Yeah. Now, well, and now I am that picky, entitled narcissist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so the other thing is that the patriarchy and the system depends on conformity, on consumerism, and to some extent on meeting, particularly for men, right? Yeah. Like... To exp- it, and I find it just to be one of the dumbest illogical things about toxic <laughs> masculinity, really, that somehow the manner in which you consume calories to give you fuel and amino acids is somehow there's a good version, there's oh, a yeah. manly version of that, and an un- like like your cells can tell the difference. Ooh, oh. he, <laughs> he he ate a manly he amino ate acid, uncooked cow. Yeah. <laughs> this configuration of nitrogen and hydrogen and oxygen and phosphorus is manly in this he other drank one. drank bull blood. Yeah. It's just like, <laughs> get over yourself. Like, is that a little elephant like, that I taste? Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just so dumb. Um, but yeah. So now, on the other flip side, I would say one out of 100 vegans, vegetarians are judgmental. Well, and it probably was. Well, no, you're right. And there, there is this angle of like... Uh, protecting animals and saving the planet. Uh, I happen to believe that there is a correlation there. At the same time, do I imagine that there's a portion of people that get very self-righteous about it? Probably. Yeah. And occasionally, whenever we, so whenever we go into this topic, because uh, I think people's vision of me doesn't compute with the carnist. And I don't know what to say. I, I should... I, sh- I don't eat that much meat. And when I have a, a choice, I don't. And I don't really, like, if, anyway, point is, is that like, I'm not one of those people that's, like, determined to eat meat. And right. there, there probably are weeks that go by that I don't eat any meat or, uh, yeah, any meat. It's just you don't mind torturing animals and, and <laughs> yeah. killing the planet. That, that's and, you. <laughs> and when I can, I try to, and there are places that have, torture free totally uh options there's a there's a hamburger restaurant in the u district that is free range i look i became organic free range all that stuff years before i became a vegan yeah because i did care i didn't want tortured animals you know yeah i mean it, it, to me it's sort of like environmentalism for cars and stuff um should I? Should any of us be driving cars? No, we should all be on bicycles or walking or something. But I find it incredibly inconvenient, and so. But I would absolutely support a governmental restriction yeah. on cars. But uh, until that happens, I'm. I just. Uh, I mean, I, my contribution is minuscule compared to everything else. So I'm just like. So it's, I feel kind of the same way about meat in that I would absolutely, absolutely support a bill that restricted practices around animal products that would actually improve the lives of these people and and reduce the environmental impact and thus cause hamburgers to cost five times as much. I would absolutely support that. Um, So, um, and I try to reduce that, you know, like there's certain... Anyway, point okay, is, I'm gonna text but, the- but 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 if but let me just finish this because I the other the two things one is is like I don't really have my defense of being a carnist very well developed because there probably isn't any well clearly not because I was gonna text our vegan cabal yeah and now I know what to say and number two I I do understand the the problem in a big way the environmental problem the animal rights problem. Uh, the health problem, perhaps. There are a lot of things. Uh, in fact, full disclosure, I had a cholesterol test last month, and I had a high, one of the numbers was high. And I was like, 
be, well, it's because I've been eating too much red meat. Sure, sure. <laughs> um, and so in the past month, I've had, I've had no red meat. Yeah. Uh, I, I've had some salmon along the way. Yeah. Um, and, and so anyway, point is, is that should I be a vegan or a vegetarian at least? Um, yeah. Um, but there's a strong cultural, I think, in a, you know, indoctrination or brainwashing or something in, into mm-hmm. the notions around some meat as food. Food is sure. a big deal to me. Food, Absolutely. food is literally 60% of my life yeah. is oriented towards food. Do you want like a chicken karage at a Japanese restaurant? Karage. Karage. Um, right. So stuff like that. Um, and I don't know what, it, I, so I try to ride that line. A nice bratwurst cooked in beer. A good brisket. I mean, okay. my God. But so, did you get any vibe from her at all like this? Was there was that one moment where she was trying to turn the guard? She said, but it didn't sound but like she was. A, but she it didn't sound like right. she was being judgmental. Yeah, yeah and know. none of the people they. Wow, well, okay, they may, who knows? But like, is Owen Wilson? Does Owen Wilson come off as like an activist? Who but would, even yeah. if you did, I I think it would be justified. You know the 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 judge. You know there are few things where judgment is warranted. This is one of them. So if people judge me for being a carnist, I don't have any defense. Sure. Is my point? Is that sure? Uh, and if, and any defense I have clearly is not articulated well because I, I'm fumbling over my own defense around I, this. I guess what I what I'm saying though is all those years that I was a carnist, <laughs> all those years that I felt threatened by a, I can count on zero hands or fingers the number of times any vegetarian or vegan said anything to me right. anywhere near you should be blah right because most vegetarians and vegans are mortified that they have to put people out. Uh, exactly. You know, in fact, the vegans and vegetarians in my life are, you know, they're loath to even say they're vegan and vegetarian. Right. You know, when they go to a dinner party, <laughs> they don't even want to mention it, you know? <laughs> so I have disclosed to my family in Colombia three different trips that I was that I was now thinking. Every trip, and I say three because, you know, the last two years I haven't been able to see them, but every trip, I had to remind at least 80% of them. And I didn't want to remind them. I didn't want to bring it up. It's just that they would see me eating only a little bit of the chicken because I would, you know, say like, well, I'll eat a little bit. And like, how come you're not eating the chicken? And like, well, I'm trying to eat less. I think I mentioned I was, like, you know, like, be like that. And it worse with my mom here in Tacoma. Like, I would, I've told her, I don't know, like a billion times. And then, even as of last year, she was like, oh, I'll make you some of that delicious chicken you love. And I was like, I, do, do you remember that? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I don't want to bring it up. It's right. just that it keeps coming up. Right. And really, it should be the opposite in terms of what's fair. The carnists should be the ones having to justify themselves. The carnists should be the ones stigmatized. The carnists should be the ones slinking up to the Thanksgiving uh, dinner and saying, ah, oh, you know, is <laughs> yeah, it okay if I have some meat? You know, how much just for one rib? <laughs> yeah, it should be that way. You know what I mean? Because that would be more fair, really. <laughs> anyway, um, all right. Final word on Bad Vegan, Berto, the documentary. And I the liked, story of yeah. Of I like the documentary well enough. Like I, I do want to say again, the music was overly dramatic. Like they dial it to eleven for far too often. But um, I, overall, I was interested. I think she was victimized. I think she was probably susceptible, and I feel bad for her. I also feel bad for the people that were defrauded by her and th- by him through her. Um, especially that one restaurant tour. That that guy seemed really nice. The guy who had given her the two million, who was in her corner, who really believed in her. Yeah. Who basically, well, he wasn't... didn't look like he was hard up for money. No, of course not. But he also he he, he wasn't like, "Where's my money, man? Where's my money?" Right. Yeah. But. I felt bad because he, he like, and he took it in the chin many times by them, right? He's like, okay, I'll meet you. Okay, why does he miss his flight all the time? Like, what's happening? Yeah. But in the end, I mostly, I fear that, you know, that guy who clearly had a rough childhood and, and should, I wish he could get help and stuff, but that guy's out there and he's he might defraud more people and it's very, very unfortunate. Yeah. Final summary is it's, one of the best examples of actual gaslighting I've ever seen. 
Sarma was 100% a victim and should not be considered culpable for the things that she did. She didn't benefit from any of the things, she, even the little decisions that she made along the way, she did not benefit. <laughs> Aside, aside from the one time when she said, let's get married because we don't have to pay taxes on the gift to me. Other than that, she, every time she was losing, obviously she felt intimidated or tricked into a cult of one and she didn't see any other way out. And, and to we have to understand that this victimization is out there. It's possible anyone can fall victim to it. And to just say like, oh, what a stupid, rich, you know, privileged woman. She should have known better is, I think, part of the victimization of these individuals. I, I do take one, one reserve there, though. Nuremberg. <laughs> Basically, if we don't criminalize the portions that are still crimes, then imagine the precedent that sets, right? Well, well I was only acting because I was being gaslit. I think you still have to draw that line, and it's very tragic. Life is tragic. The universe is tragic, but well, there is a there line, though, lines. and I get that, and I don't yeah. know the legality, but we could dial it back a little bit and say, let's say that it's a kid. Let's say that Sarma and yeah. Anthony have a kid. It's a 10-year-old that's been totally brainwashed, yeah. and the kid goes on some kind of shopping, shoplifting spree. Do we say that kid needs to go to juvie? No, of course not. We'd say, well, that kid was, it's a kid yeah. you know, being abused. They're gaslit. They're brainwashed. Yeah. Do we take someone who, like Patty Hearst, who was uh, Stockholm syndromed? And, you know, the story of Patty Hearst is, you know, pretty interesting. She, I th believe, so she's kidnapped by a terrorist group, the Libyan Liberation Front or something. Yeah. And, no, Symbionese, I believe, oh, Symbionese. which is, anyway, they, I think, locked her in a closet for like a month, and I think assaulted her sexually, I'm not sure. And then she became part of the um, right. the crime terrorist group. At first, she was just like a ransom victim, and then over time, she slowly adopted, but she was being tortured, you know? So... Is she responsible for robbing the banks? I mean, the other thing that I'll say that I haven't said that you kind of alluded to earlier was I think this documentary shows she's not out of the gaslighting. No, she's not. She, she's not. Has she been? Because you have to work with a therapist that understands gaslighting. Yeah. It's like a deprogramming. It's a very slow process. It takes years to deprogram yourself from that. So yeah. I think we were yeah. seeing her with one foot in the gaslighting delusion and one foot out. Oh, yeah. But there was that one moment she said, uh, well, what was I supposed to do? Tell my family? They would have probably had me committed, which might have helped me. That was a very telling thing to say. Yeah. That first of all, she thought that it's an irrational, crazy idea to tell her family. And two, that the consequences might be her being committed. And three, that even that actually seemed like maybe that would have helped her. <laughs> because it was a way out. All those three things point to me that like, yeah, she's not quite fully cleared. Right. And the way that she described it, you know, she would say things like, well, you know, in some instances she say, well, you know, I would imagine that 10 years from now when she describes what happens, she'll be like, oh, my God, he completely gaslit me. He completely yeah, totally. tricked me. It was this totally bizarre story. And I don't even know – because – you could almost see her still defending herself on some level, like, and and you know, like when they ask her, "How come you didn't tell the investor guy, your friend, that Chris was in fact Anthony?" and she's like, "Well, I don't know. It just didn't seem to matter because we are all going to get our money." Exactly. And it's like, I think ten years from now, she's going to say, "Because I was brainwashed." Right. In that moment in the interview, unless the producers were putting it up. up putting her up to answering in that way which is a possibility i don't think so it looked, she it looked, looked like she honestly was still like well i don't know what would you do right uh, well actually but but here's still my point so the kid that you were mentioning so they end up uh the kid has some disease the mom decides not to take the kid because the 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 dad is telling her that he's got some magical power the child dies is the mom not responsible for the child? Yes, she still is responsible for the child. Does it suck that she was brainwashed? Well, yes. Okay. I would be happy with a little bit of consequence like what Sarma got, maybe. But more importantly, I want 
the Anthony's of oh, the yeah. world. Oh, yeah, times 20. Yeah. Yeah. He was convicted to no time. Exactly. No, no. So I don't disagree. Like, 0% disagreement. 100% agreement. It's just that for both legal reasons, precedent reasons, and, you know, overall justice, yeah. I don't think there's zero blame. But mostly 100 to 1. Yeah. All right, y'all. Let us know what you think. And everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it.